Hello and welcome to episode 120 of the Paropod. You're here with your host Mark and Owen yet again for the 120th episode. I feel like, one, a clap I feel on like the 120 back. actually is somewhat of a milestone. That actually kind of is a milestone. Yeah, yeah, that's pretty big. 120, that divides into a whole host of numbers. Uh, yeah, I always feel like 20s, sets of 20s, sets mm. of 50s. That's 100s. 125 is coming up. So, yeah, 125 is also a very yeah. satisfying number. That's a pretty big number. You know? And then it's a long road to 150. <laughs> <laughs> I was only thinking because uh, at this stage, the other, the other day, I was like, right, we're halfway through the year. I was like, I'm going to start filling out the recommended films list just to make it easier on myself than to do it at the end of the year. Man, there's only fucking like 20 films. There's like fucking, yeah, there's only 20 films now. So I think at the end of the year we're gonna have forty films ish. What What do you mean twenty films? Because when we initially did the list, yeah, of like ranking all the films, there was like nearly like a hundred films. Yeah, it was like yeah. eighty. No, that's a lie. There was only. Well, we did two years worth of films. Sorry, no, that's a lie because we didn't do one every episode. I think it was like fifty ish films. Mm. Fifty plus ish. Uh, yeah, yeah, I think you're right. Yeah, but I'm gonna yeah, I think we're gonna add to the films by having. Wild cards. Wild card films. Okay. <laughs> From our series reviews. Yeah, yeah, Just yeah, toss yeah. them in. Yeah, get them in there. Rocky deserves to be in there. Alien deserves to be in there. Rocky's actually already there because Rocky is was a recommended film. Was it? But Rocky Four needs to be in there. <laughs> <laughs> it does. That's a, that's a, that is a wild card if I've ever seen a wild card. Um, also, maybe Rocky Bobo, which is part of this episode, mm-hmm. uh, as we get on to later. But it's not our recommended film. It's not. That's a great point, on. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's not our recommended film. Our recommended film for this episode is Can Dialectics Break Bricks? A film by the Situationists uh, from 1973 or something like that. Uh, yeah, I think it's 72. So, yeah, 72, 73, early 70s. Uh, <clears throat> kind of uh, more of an artifact in the film. Uh, we'll get onto that later, but it's quite interesting. Point, yeah. It's a weird fucking movie. It's a strange film. It's a film that you would n- you've never seen before. I no. Know. Obviously, because no one's ever seen this fucking film. Yeah. Like, no one's ever heard of this film. Bro, this is the type of film where I watched it on YouTube and all the all the comments on it were in French. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. On, on my one, there was just two comments. And one was like, the best kung fu movie of all time. Oh, bro. Yeah, it must be so misleading if someone's just like looking up kung fu movies on YouTube, you know? Because um, it's not really a kung fu movie. Spoilers, but I think this is the worst kung fu movie I've ever yeah, seen. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> It has some decent fights, but it's like, it's not related to what's happening <laughs> in the dialogue. Um, the the one English comment on my one was, "Cool, cool, yeah, I love those comments." <laughs> <laughs> so someone, so why did you butter? <laughs> you know, someone just comments their name. You know, YouTube comments are like the uh, fucking Vienna cafes of the twenty first centuries, where all the genius, all like yeah. all the great conversations, all the great observations happen in YouTube comments. That and our own comments on on Instagram. Yeah, yeah. Promote this on at whatever music records. <laughs> Empire Records. Yeah, Empire is always yeah, sad. it's always Empire <laughs> Records. It's a great movie. But <laughs> not, too, not too sure if I'm that arsed. <laughs> yeah, I don't think so. Um, yeah, we get a few of them as well, yeah. Just the spam. The spam bots. The bots. The they bots. always find you. They always find us, you Just know. Just rooting through the internet trying to find you. Just trying to get engaged. Give me a fucking it's like. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, how you been on? How, how's 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 tricks? I have literally no news of the, the fucking the, not the past two weeks. I've also done nothing either. I've, I've I no just, real. No I just real watched, news. A, watched a few movies. What's like? Yeah, we're getting onto it, but I watched quite a few horror films. Mm. I've been a horror. I feel like <laughs> in the middle of July. In the middle of July, <laughs> I was like, I just need to watch some horror films. Yeah, yeah. I'm watching like fucking action movies and stuff. Like that. I'm like. This ain't scratching that itch. Watch a few horror films. Like, haha, there we are. <laughs> there we go. There we go. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Right there. right there. Right mm. there. Oh, cracking me back to it. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I want. <laughs> um, are you going to go see any movies? There's a few movies out now. There's Mission Impossible's out today. I haven't seen any of the Mission Impossible. I haven't seen a single Mission Impossible film. They're very good, man. Yeah. They're actually very good. They're, they're, they're actually genuinely very good. Yeah, no. It's like a, that's a film franchise that I'm always like, I need to watch these films. I Next just... recommended series. No, that'd be terrible because every every film is the exact same. Yeah, and they're all fucking like two and a half hours yeah, long. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The new one's three hours long, uh, but has ninety nine percent on Rotten Tomatoes. Yeah, I 99. that's yeah. Whoa, you know. I feel like that. It's been a good year for action films. You had that film and you had John Wick, mm. which were 
John Wick was this yeah, John Wick four was this year. I also haven't seen I've only ever seen the first John Wick. John Wick, yeah. Fucking John Wick is good. But I haven't John Wick four is meant to be like people saying like that's the best action film. One of the greatest action films ever made. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. I that, don't know. But like, I'm just like, oh, i got to watch one to three to get to that. <laughs> yeah, right. They're pro- probably like two and a half hours, are they? I think they're only two hours. That's that's, that's really Only. Really I think John Wick 4 is like two hours, 45 minutes or something like that. Fuck me. Like. Yeah. Was I telling you I rewatched like Mad Max Fury Road recently? No, I didn't hear. Oh, man, that film's so good. It's so good. So fucking it's good. It's so good. Because I, I, I find it hard to trust like kind of uh, like action movies. I think we've talked about this before. Where I think, like to be a good action movie, there's like the it's it's not a terribly high bar. Like, you don't have to be like you don't yeah. have to change the genre to be a good action movie. Yeah. You just like you can just be a good action movie. Mm-hmm. You don't need to be doing anything too interesting. Um, I remember when Winter Soldier came out. That's a great action movie. Yeah, that's not. Action film. It's not a great movie. It's just a, it's a good action movie. Yeah. Loads of other Fast and Furious, great action movies. Mm. Uh, Mission Impossible, great action movies. But like they're not. You wouldn't go back again, again, again. Certain people would. I wouldn't. The um, Raid is the only action film that I ever that I always return to. Yeah, I I, I have yet to even uh, stumble upon the Raid. I have to I have to, I have to go into the Raid. But I remember actually, or, uh, Mad Max Fury Road. I was like, I came out of that. I was like, that was the greatest action film I ever made. I think as well that is a very innovative film. Yeah, like yeah. there's so many there's so many different bits. Of, like there's no other film like this. Mm. Whereas with like the Mission Impossible films, there's quite a few films that are like the Mission Impossible yeah, films, and they're all in the same series. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Same thing with Fast and Furious films. Mm. There's quite a few in the Fast and Furious franchise. John Wick, there's three before it. Like there's similar enough films, but Mad Max Fury Road is his kind of its own thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's 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 a unique film. Um it's very nice to look at, you know. Oh, it's gorgeous. It's very fun. Would you ever be arsed to watch it in black and white? No, absolutely yeah. not. No, neither. I, I don't know why they bothered with that. Yeah, it's like I like I have the I have a dual box set where they have or box set. I have the dual uh, Blu-ray. Blu-ray. Thank you, Jesus. Mm. Couldn't think of the word. Um, and one of it is the black and white, but it's too pretty. Yeah, like it's too colorful. I actually think it's. It, it, I actually think it's too colorful. Full stop. Yeah, I, <laughs> there's, <laughs> there's maybe a critique I have. Yeah, yeah. I actually, I, th- I think there's. It could have con- kind of t- toned down the colors a little bit. Um, the but music, like, oh. yeah, but the music and like the actual, I don't know, just like the general kind of. Because when the, there's like four or five different trailers before they release it, because it's in production for fucking like <laughs> seven, eight years, yeah. something like that. Um, I kind of preferred the old color scheme, and then but the but the one that came out was kind of like was really orange. Really, <laughs> yeah, it was really orange, but it was also there's loads of other mad colors thrown in. Mm-hmm. Very, very, very colorful film. Uh, I just I don't understand the appeal of a black and white. I don't really understand the appeal of any black and white movie. Yeah, I don't, I really don't know it. why why you'd ever go for a black and white it's unless like, the film is intended to be in black and white yeah yeah like you could have like a silent Mad Max and like that was actually one of the I, I remember when they're doing the storyboard not like fully I silent but yeah. just the music yeah you know because when they were storyboarding the film I remember uh, reading about how George Miller had this idea that he wanted to be able to he wanted for someone to, to be able to understand what was happening even if there was no sound yeah so storyboarded in that way and you can watch the film in that in that fashion but you won't get the music and the music's mm-hmm. very is a key part of it yeah um but i would kind of prefer it more like you, you could do it without sound mm-hmm. um but without color what's the fucking point yeah i just look out the window <laughs> <laughs> it's like it's so, in Ireland it's yeah. so grey even in summer so. yeah why would I go spend three hours staring <laughs> at black and white <laughs> different how dark it was <laughs> um, yeah like even like um, I always think like this not like the more most recent watch I had of it I was really noticing how like your eyes don't have to look around the mm. screen like everything is more or less dead center in the screen mm. for like Here's like if you're looking at the screen, there's a quick cut to something else, but your eye doesn't have to f- track to see what's going on. Yeah. So clear as to what's happening every mm. cut. Um, it was his wife that edited that film as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wasn't it like the only film, or like it's like the first time she edited an action film or something? Like I don't know. That? I don't know. I think it was something along those lines where she hadn't edited an action film or maybe even a film. Mm. I don't think it was. Surely she'd edited. She's clearly edited something before. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> I don't know what she'd edited, but uh, she's I'd never used a computer before. Yeah, she, she was there a fucking snippet <laughs> <of> film. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, you know that like uh, editing film used to just be done by women. Why? Because because uh, it was done with uh, scissors and stuff like that. So it was 
like women used to the fucking be seamstresses and stuff like that, so they would They were the best. They were the they were they used to edit films. Oh right, I didn't know that. Yeah, yep. Yeah, yeah. A bit of film history there for you. Bit of film history. Yeah, that's that's weird. Mm. Uh, a lot of the time I think it would be like the director's wife or sister or someone someone that someone that uh, someone else knew. Yeah, it's like, oh, yeah. my sister sews, she can do this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, when's the next Mad Max coming out? Is it next year or did it get pushed to the year after? Furiosa coming out in 2024. I don't yeah. believe that. Yeah, it's coming out next year for like 10 years. The Avatar films got pushed as well. i seen that, yeah. And also uh, Spider-Verse, the next one got pushed. The next animated one? Yeah. Yeah. Part two of the one that just came out. It was, was meant to come out next year, but it got pushed to the year after. 2025. Yeah, it's like, oh. That's a bit for like a... Uh, a two-parter, that's a bit of a stretch. A bit of a stretch, especially when it ends on a fucking cliffhanger. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> especially if I, like, even Dune is a bit of a stretch. Like, I feel like people will kind of be confused. I kind of forget that Dune is coming out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, is that I coming think, out I think next it's December. Year? December. December, okay. Mm, it's coming out this year, definitely. Well. Uh, but it's been two years. Yeah, it's uh, kind of... I spent three years nearly. Well, no, yeah, two years. Two years, yeah. Two years, yeah. I think, like, it's like part ones and part twos need to come out, like, one year after... Mm. the other because you need to have that ready yeah you need to, you need to have that in the oven ready to come out you need to be like coming out in the like you need to be in like the cultural hive mind I kind of mm. forgot I kind of forget that I've seen Dune <laughs> yeah I can't forget I think Dune was great but, I thought Dune was great as well but, but like but, yeah two years it's like come on hurry it up you know I know, I know you're perfectionist and all that shit come on just like to be just fair, shit it out it doesn't mean I do have to rewatch Dune which I'm not mad about I, I I would I would prefer to rewatch it on a huge screen. Yeah, though, you know. Hopefully they do like a re-release of it in IMAX again. If they do, if they do that and the reasonable prices, I would definitely go. Like it's thirty quid a ticket. Fuck that. By the time this episode, no, no, not by the time this episode comes out, but fucking Oppenheimer and Barbie coming out. Yeah, you're gonna go see them. Yeah, hundred percent. Both of them. I think I might try and see if I can do both of them on the same day. I think that'd be hilarious. That'd be like <laughs> six hours of movies, wouldn't it? Yeah, perfect. <laughs> <laughs> I think you should start with. Oppenheimer and then watch Barbie. <laughs> uh, I don't know. I don't know. I think I'd do the reverse. You start with like happiness and end on sadness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, once it gets dark, well, I suppose you'd have to wait quite a while for it to get dark. <laughs> it's in the middle of summer. <laughs> but like, I don't know. Because you get, because Oppenheimer is such a slog. It's going to be three hours. It's about nuclear bombs, you know? Um, yeah. Or maybe it is probably better to end on a high note. Yeah, yeah. And <laughs> end in color and sunshine and happiness. Yeah, oh, if Oppenheimer is like what? half in black and white, I'm gonna snap. What if what if Barbie turns out to be really fucking? What if Barbie turns out to be darker than Oppenheimer? That would be amazing. Like I'd the love message that. is way more grim. I'd love that. That'd be great. <laughs> like I've Opp- seen there's like there's musical numbers in it as well. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think it's gonna. Be, I think Barbie's gonna be a bop. Mm. I've seen lots of people be like, "Where the fuck are people excited about Barbie?" Shut up, nerd. <laughs> That's why. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I'll, I'll definitely see them both at some stage. Um, but yeah, when's the twenty sixth, twenty first, something like that. Something like that. Yeah. I think 24th. Yeah, it's like, I'm not in the country. I'm a, I'm on holidays. Uh, and they come out, which I'm low-key snapping about. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'll go see them the week after. But it'll be it'll be fun. It'll be good. It'll be good. Summer's the summer blockbusters are looking good. Did you, just only because whatever, thinking about Barbie and Oppenheimer made me think about this. Have you ever seen that clip of Matt Damon talking about why certain films are made now? No. Um, so there's a clip of Matt Damon talking about how the films that he used to, like his bread and butter, as he used to talk about, like kind of mm. like romance films and like films about love triangles and you know stuff like that, mm. used to get made because they would be made and they didn't have to worry about making all their money at the box office because they could rely on the DVD release to make, mm. m- make the second wave of money. Mm-hmm. That's not there anymore. No one buys DVDs. So they, you have to make all your money essentially at the box office. Yeah. So yeah. that's why every film is an already established IP or a remake or you know something along those lines. Mm. Very few like original films, smaller films like that can be made. Like he was talking about like this film that was just going to be him and like a few actors like as a romance film, and it was fucking going to cost. 20 million just mm. to get that film made and there was n- like it was like not gonna get the back I think it was just 25 million or 30 million it's like there's not a guarantee that it's gonna make 30 million at the box office <laughs> mm, yeah yeah it is it's yeah it has the same effect on music as well doesn't it yeah like just kind of the 
the whole streaming model, all that, all that shit. You gotta make a song that can fit into a Spotify playlist. Yeah, yeah, singles, mm. only singles. Um, has to have the vibe and all that stuff. Um, yeah, it's kind of sad. Kinda it is sad. sad. Like you all know? the the middle, the middle films, like, just they don't exist. How, how uh, you know useful and how convenient technology has made it. It has really destroyed the it's kinda, industries. It's kind of backfired. <laughs> it has backfired massively. It was like everything <laughs> sounds the same <laughs> and everything is the same yeah. and everything's a fucking already established IP. Yeah, everything says the same thing. Um, but like all the you see all the blockbusters recently have been bombing. Everything's been bombing. Uh, bombing uh, left, left, right, and center. Except why for Spider Verse, I think you had Flash, Elementals, which no one watched. Yeah, no one. Pro- was, like that cost two hundred million. Indiana Jones, one of the most expensive films ever made, bombed. Yeah, bombed. To be fair, to be fair, <laughs> no one is going to watch them anyway. No <laughs> one's going to watch them anyway. I like because you like I remember seeing like Elemental advertised, and I was it like, looked shit. who the fuck is going to go see yeah, that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like yeah. that's just it doesn't look good. It just looks yeah. It's like oh, another. It just looks like every other Pixar yeah, film. Yeah, it looks like... Yeah, and Pixar films... Ones... Looks like Inside Out, but like... Oh, no, it's about elements this time. What was the one that came... There was another one that came out after Inside Out. Oh, Soul, but Soul fucking went straight to streaming as well. Also, Soul came out during COVID, so... Mm. That was kind of... I saw it was good. I yeah, it was. Yeah. But again, that's not a film that people... Are, I don't feel people are going to see that in cinema. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, there's like... There's... I don't know. There's a certain vibe and a certain tone with Pixar films. You're like... ah. I don't need to see this. Yeah, I don't need to see it in cinema. At yeah. least, you know. It's like, Especially because it's, like, it's going to be out on Disney Plus in like three months' time. Yeah, yeah, like, exactly. Like, you can yeah. wait. Yeah, like a day out with the kids or just fucking wait because you're already paying for the service that will be on in a few months. Yeah, and then you can just stick it on and have a free day that day. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We you have a uh, Mission Impossible is also one of the most expensive films ever made. I feel like the film's going to do well, though. I feel like it'll do pretty well. I don't think it'll do that well, though. It's not, it's not Avatar 2. It's not Avatar 2, I'll tell you that. And then Dune is also one of the most expensive films ever made. And but I think that has the same thing with Oppenheimer, where that's a film where like you need to go to the cinema yeah, to see yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, that's the thing. Yeah, like uh-huh. you need to like if you're gonna make films that like are gonna cost a lot, you need to have a reason for people to go to the cinema to see it. There is nothing about Indiana Jones that tells me I need to go to see that in the cinema. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Especially the the track record, the reviews. Um, that film went out at Cannes as well. It's fucking awful. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think because um, people noticed when I think it was Elementals and Indiana Jones premiered at Cannes, which is very That's a ir- bad idea. Yeah, very irregular thing for Disney to do because they own both properties. They very rarely release their, their films at, at those kind of uh, events. Uh, like the reviews were shit for both of them. Yeah, like they both got like like half of the reviews were positive. Um. None of them were glowing. Mm. Like, half were positive, half were like, these ones are shit. Um, but then, as soon as they were released, all of a sudden, you know, it goes way, like, the other the yeah. tomato meter goes yeah, way yeah, up. Yeah, the Metacritic score goes up. Yeah, the audience score goes way, all this stuff, like, you know. Um, like, when they're actually exposed to real critics, it actually just dampens the hype. They because don't they, do they, that. <laughs> they generally aren't actually good films or, like, you know, worth going to see um, on their own or worth paying, like, 20, 25 quid. Yeah. In this climate. In, in this, this economy? economy? Come on. No, I'm not going to see Indiana Jones for 25 beans. Having no way. S- having said that, I did go to the cinema to see a film that I maybe didn't have to go to the cinema to see. What? I went to go see the new Insidious movie. <laughs> ah. Well, you need a, you need a little a cinema uh, trip every now and then, you know? Insidious it never lets you down. That That's kind of a cinematic film, I think. The Dark Room. We only went because it was two for a tenner on a Sunday. <laughs> Where's this? Uh, are you a three? No. Oh, never mind then. Fuck. Three offer, yeah, that's, that's good. good. That's very good. Only an IMCs. Ah, uh, okay. So you're kind of limited. It's a boy. Just talking about, like, cinemas as well. You know, like, all right, so, Odeon, you get the fucking uh, iSense. Yeah, yeah. You go Cineworld, you get the IMAX screen. Mm. What the fuck do IMC cinemas have? What's their what's their draw to get you to go? They used to have the galactic screen in Savoy. They do have that in Santry, actually. They yes. have they have a galactic. They have a galactic screen. Do they? Like a huge? I don't know. It wasn't it was fucking insidious. It wasn't that screen? I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just know they used to have in Savoy, but they tore it down. It was like the only reason you'd ever go to Savoy. Yeah. Like in, like any other experience in Savoy, it's just a lot of like scallies, like just like throwing shit around, or like kicking chairs and stuff like that. I actually saw a film on the Galactic screen as well. The Galactic is, is a good screen. Yeah, I they saw... They divided it into two. 
Planet of the Apes, Rise, no, Dawn. Dawn, yeah. Which what was the first one, Dawn? R- Rise is the first one. Rise, I saw yeah, Rise yeah, of Planet yeah, yeah. of the Apes. Yeah. It was a good screen, it was big, Fuck loud. Huge screen. You know? Yeah, yeah. Huge screen. Um, but yeah, no, IMC, I don't really get IMC. They're always a bit scaldy. They're a bit scaldy. You know? Nice like popcorn scaldy. though. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but it's the scaldiness that makes it. Yeah, them. yeah. It's like, oh, it's the whole place. So bad for the me. whole place stinks of popcorn. Yeah. <laughs> no, this you man, we walked into, San- into the one in Sanchi, and I immediately turned to Melissa and was like, this place smells like a cinema. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. They have a, like a particular smell. To like them. Odeon Cinema, you know. Although I will say that the uh, Cineworld also mm, vaguely has that smell, but it's not as. It's not as pungent. It's yeah. not as pungent, <laughs> yeah. Like, this shit is like fucking cologne you can wear. Like. <laughs> <laughs> this is Savoy carpet. Uh, oh, the toilets. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just they're, popcorn. Yeah, they're, they're always fucking. I, think, I just don't think they're. They're not the nicest cinemas. Yeah, yeah. They have a bit of charm, but like I'm not sure what the attraction is. Are they cheaper than? than no. <laughs> <laughs> well, at least have those deals. Ten, yeah. ten, ten, two for ten on, on Sundays. It's yeah. pretty good. I think yeah, that's like. That's, that's as good as you're gonna get. It's good, but like they also they also do um the same thing with Odeon and Limitless. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's more expensive. Yeah, yeah, because yeah, the whole the whole membership is pretty expensive now. I think Odeon was sixteen. I think Odeon's sixteen, seventeen euro. And the whatever the fuck IMC's one is is a euro more expensive, but it's also like, okay, so you got the Savoy and I have Santry. What other ones are there, <laughs> and what do they offer? At least with fucking Odin, you can. I don't think Isense is covered by Limitless, but there's more Odin yeah, Kulak, screens. Kulak as well. Yeah, you got Kulak. That's Odin. Is it? Yeah, I that's thought an that was IMC. That's, that's, an o- IMC. That's, a, that's an Odeon now. Oh, what? Yeah. <laughs> so you got the point. You got Odeon imperialism. You got fucking Blanchestown. You got uh, Kulak. I'm sure there's definitely another, I'm sure there's another Odeon somewhere else. It's uh-huh. relatively near. But it's like, this fuck all. Fuck all IMC. So why the fuck would I pay for a subscription <laughs> service to that? Yeah, it's a bit grim. You know? There's not a lot of options, though. No. Not a lot of options in that market. No. How is Insidious anyway? Uh, Insidious is pure grand. It's okay. It kind of suffered because of, well, we'll talk about it later. But I watched another horror film the day before, which was also a jump scare fest. Yeah, uh, it was better than that other film, which we will get onto, <laughs> um, but not by a lot. <laughs> yeah, that's not good. Um, that ain't good. There was a few, but like, there's a few times I think. So this Insidious Five, uh, Red Door. This is that? Insidious Five. This is Insidious Five, yeah. <laughs> like it's not called Insidious Five. It's called Insidious the Red Door or Red Door. The scary door. This, the, the big spooky red door. <laughs> um, it has a few little bits in it that's in- interesting. Mm-hmm. Um, it's directed by Patrick Wilson. Oh, very good. It's his first time directing a film. Good, good on him, Patrick. You did a good job, bro. <laughs> you good. directed a very solid film. Good for him. It's well shot. Got good uh, sequences. Script is a bit ass, but that's not on you, bro. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so this continues on from... So the way that the Insidious franchise works is you got one and two that are connected. You got three that's separate. You have four that's separate. And then you have the fifth one that ties back to one and two. It's a, it's a, it's a sequel to one and two. So it has Patrick Wilson and Rose Byrne and... Uh Yes. Very little yeah. Rose Byrne, though. She's not really in it. What the fuck? Yeah. It much more follows... It follows Patrick Wilson playing Dad, whatever the fuck his <laughs> name is. <laughs> and you have uh, his son, who was the kid in 1 and 2. It's the same actors again. Ah, very good. And there you're a... The ma- the, so Patrick Wilson's mom in the film is is dead. It starts off at her funeral. And you quickly realize that, like, the family unit from 1 and 2 has, like, fallen apart. Mm. And I'm real glad that they had a flashback to explain the ending of Insidious 2. Because I did not remember what happened. What happened at the end of Insidious 2? They, uh, the the dad and the son get hypnotized so that they can't remember what happened in 1 and 2. Oh, okay, okay. So it's like, for the last last past year of your life, you will not remember what happened. Mm -hmm. But the problem with that is that, um... The son and the dad are still kind of connected to the other side. Where the fuck? I think they just call it the other. Mm. They're still connected to that, and uh, the family unit has fallen apart because again, I forgot about this. Patrick Wilson tried to kill them. 
in the second film because he was possessed by a ghost and tried to murder them with a baseball bat. I forgot that as well. Um, yeah, completely forgot about that. <laughs> um, so they're still li- they're moving on from the trauma of this, but like the kids were so young that they can't. One of them can't remember what happened, and he's the only one that could vaguely explain <laughs> what what happened to the other kids. Um, so they're all kind of scared of the dad, and they can't really remember what happened, and they have all this trauma. So the f- like they're not. No one speaks to each other, and the son, the eldest son. Elliot, I think his name is. He's going off to college, and uh, Patrick Wilson's character is like, "Look, I got all these fucking problems and issues, and I don't know what's wrong. I can't. I've been hazy for the last like eight years. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what's wrong with me. I'm gonna go get myself checked out." Yeah, yeah. And then he starts to uh, be haunted by ghosts, and meanwhile, the son is uh connecting back to the other side and is um what's that word astral projecting mm. um again because he's in art college and he's with this really intense art teacher who is um Logan Roy's wife from Succession. Ah, uh, very good. Her the French one. The French one. Yeah, yeah. She's the art teacher. And she's like, you need to get into your brain and you need to meditate to produce real art. So he starts meditating and as slightly astral projecting. Mm. And then like, he starts painting this red door. Uh. And it's the door from the <laughs> other side and things are coming true. But like, so the film doesn't have any real scares. It's got some like spooky bits where like Patrick Wilson is sitting in the car and you can see someone fading into shot behind him mm. and he's like the, they're coming up closer and closer and closer and like what the fuck is that and then he leans across to fix something and he looks back and the person's gone yeah. and like ooh. ooh and then like no scares happen for ages uh-huh. and then <laughs> the most abrupt out of nowhere jump scare happens and I fucking shit myself. I was like, that's a great jump scare. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then from that point on, it's jump scare, jump scare, jump scare, jump scare, jump scare. Constantly. Uh, and like, like 45 minutes, 50, you know, 50 minutes. And I into the film. I was like, I am so sick of this. I'm so sick of jump scares. <laughs> I was just sitting there. I was like, ah, oh, I thought it's been ages since I watched like a jump scare movie. Mm. And I watched two back to back. Um, That like I was sitting there. I was like, ah, oh, this is. I'm bored. Like, I am not scared. I am building up tension from the scene, but mm. I'm not scared. I'm just preparing myself with a loud bang. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Some of the imagery in the film is really cool. This like, because the son is doing this painting and he paints this, like, horrifying halfway image where, like, he's remembering something, but he can't remember what it is, so he's painting it. And it's like this awful looking figure like at the door and then later on he like fills in a bit more and it's it's patrick wilson he's like oh shit he's now remembering what happened yeah yeah. he remembers his dad trying to kill him but he can't remember why his dad was trying to kill him he just thinks his dad went fucking mental um there's the red mask guy is back in this Mm. movie oh he's scary he's scary Mm. a lot less scary in this film because you can really see the height of him and on how, how tall is he like, I was sitting there in the cinema, I leaned over to Melissa, I was like, I could kick the shit out of that ghost. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's kind of, isn't it, is he like just average height? He's a little bit under. <laughs> so he's like, what, like, he's like 5'8". He's like 5'4". He's like 5'4". Five 5'5". Four. Five five. That's kind of creepy though, no? Yeah, but not in a way where like, he's you like, You kind of oh, need to be a little bit smaller, I and then like, they'd be like, whoa, what the hell? Yeah, I think you need to be like, like, really tall. I think you need to be way smaller or way taller. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've this like, image of like a, like a, a small ghost just running around, so like, that seems kind of like... Small, small, powerful ghost with claws. This film, I was like, oh, I could kick the shit out of that ghost. He's, he's just a, a small, a relatively small man. An inconvenient man. <laughs> <laughs> he's more of an annoyance than a ghost. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah and there's all this stuff where like, he's astro projecting and he's trying to figure out like what happened to him. There's this whole like, kind of... S- there's this real... And I found it kind of weird that the film threw this in really quickly. Mm. He goes to a frat house... And the frat house leader is just like, uh, they're having a party. And he's like, we don't want another incident like last time. Like, careful of your drink. Mm. And then there's a, he sees a ghost of a kid getting p- sick into the toilet. And I was 
like those two things did not connect immediately until afterwards where they're like oh yeah we need to, that was the kid that died uh, and I was like oh so that was why it just didn't why was that in the film it didn't mesh right they were just showing that the kid was seeing things showing that the kid was seeing things but I just thought that he was just seeing a ghost like what? Like he's seen he's seen mad shit all the fucking time yeah, so yeah. it didn't immediately connect into my brain that that was that the incident was someone that a kid had died while drinking mm. Um. And then there's a uh, yeah, and then they go back to it because that then becomes a more important plot point. Where he's like, "Oh, I need to astral project so I can ask the ghost what happened to me or something like that." I can't remember <laughs> what it was. Um, and then the end is like just like a kind of vague action sequence with the dad coming to save the son on the other side, and it's not really satisfying. Mm. Like people, I feel like other people might find it satisfying, but I didn't find all that satisfying. Um, like it's a whole family reunion and stuff, and even like, uh, cause I, I th- like halfway through the film, I was like, why didn't Rose Byrne tell Patrick Wilson what happened? He yeah. just, his man's whole life fell apart, <laughs> and she could just easily tell him what happened, but she just doesn't. <laughs> that would just make him even more insane. No? Yeah. Oh yeah, he's fucking. He's like, I understand why you did that. I was like, do you? <laughs> 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 I'd be fucking raging. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I feel like it's kind of important to tell me that I was haunted by ghosts my entire life. <laughs> <laughs> You're not going to believe this, Patrick. <laughs> but this is what happened. He believes you know? He believes because his dad... Oh, man, there's a real bad... There's like, such bad exposition at the start of the film where Patrick Wilson's like, listen, I know that my dad was really shit and wasn't around for me, but you... They talk to his son like, I'm here for you. And, and the son's like, listen, dad, just because you didn't get over your trauma. And I was like, oh, fuck off. Ah, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just because you've unresolved trauma from the previous four films doesn't mean you can take it out on me. <laughs> yeah, it's just, uh, you know. Uh, but it's like, it's grand. It's like a decent horror film. Mm. Well, that's what you want. You know? To an extent. Not a film I re- relatively needed to go to the cinema to go see, but... Um, if it's cheap. Fact, I kind of wish I didn't because, man, I really, like, don't like jump scares. And, like, watching jump scares in the cinema is just not all that fun. I like it. Ugh. But they never come out anymore. They good, don't. Good ones don't come out. They don't. And also, to be fair, I was watching this film. I was like, I haven't seen a film of like this sort of horror film in ages. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like an aggressive haunting film. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> where yeah, the yeah. ghosts are real pissed off. Yeah, like a violent haunting. Um, I think if it, well, more people see them if it was cheaper to go. You know, five euro, five euro go. Mm. Well, I'd be, I'd be in, I'd be in once every two weeks, seeing whatever was out. You know. But I'm not paying like 17 euro to go see Inception 5, you know? Yeah. Or sorry, Insidious 5. <laughs> <laughs> I paid 20 quid to see that. Inception 5. I yeah, love yeah. that they just Inception <laughs> and then next with Inception 5. So you hit the other four happened in a parallel universe yeah. where you haven't awoken from. It's like they were all dreams that you've had. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They're all the, the collective dream that we've all had, been having for the last 10 years. It's still 2011. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, well, Insidious is say that's good. I like Insidious one. I like Insidious two to a lesser extent. But do you prefer? Because in my in my in my brain, Insidious and Conjuring films, I think they came out like relative at the same time, similar time. Yeah. Which do you prefer? The Conjuring, first? not even close. Yeah, was not even yeah, close. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Conjuring is amazing horror film. Yeah, I think I'm a big fan of Conjuring. I don't like the sequels too much, but like I liked I the original was very good. I like Conjuring two. I don't really remember Conjuring two. Conjuring two is. Decent. So we've mm. got the nun. Like I think, the, I think the nun. I, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, I remember it's all right. I didn't yeah. like as much the first. Conjuring two is because uh, Insidious two is way less of like Insidious two is nearly like an action film kind of, or like a psychological yeah. thriller. Uh, it's less so of a horror film, but the mm. story in Insidious two is really cool. I can't mm. remember it off the top of my head, but I remember it being cool at the time. Um, Did we go see? It? We saw. I saw the Insidious two in the cinema. No, oh, I didn't. School see, trip. I didn't see it. No, okay. no, no. Everyone's laughing the entire time. The, yeah. entire, the entire like audience is laughing. <laughs> I was kind of like, we're just trying to take the screen, take this seriously, guys. <laughs> Shut up, Patrick Wilson is speaking. <laughs> yeah, because the first one was really scary. Um, but yeah, Orla has this really funny story about like uh, she's seen the city two in the cinemas as well. She got free tickets to go see Dark Knight Rises, and for some reason they're doing like a double showing of Insidious two and Dark Knight Rises. What a very strange double bill. And she doesn't really like horror films, especially in the cinema. Um. Because she gets the, the jump scares get to her, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, so she she watched, she was with her sister, she watched Insidious 2 all the way through. 
Um, but she got so scared, she just left before the Dark Knight Rises started. That's so it's like she got the free tickets for like, <laughs> didn't actually stay to watch the film. <laughs> it was like a red. It was like the premiere as well. Like it's like a red carpet kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> she just left. She's too scared by Insidious 2. <laughs> it's not even that scary a film. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, Insidious, uh, it's run its course. Oh, uh, yeah. Like, it's run its course. And I think this film kind of ends in a way it's like, these movies are done. Unless yeah, they do, yeah. like, because Conjuring, uh, Conjuring, Insidious 3 and Insidious 4 are, like, completely separate. Like, they're not tied. The only tie is that mystical old woman. Yeah, I didn't. I don't think I've seen either of them, to be honest. I didn't like the old woman. I didn't, didn't find her interesting at all or scary. Well, she's like the main character of three and four. I'm yeah, I'm not, not going to watch them because she's the vehicle of which we can go explore other cases. Um, what so. they need to do is a conjuring <clears throat> that crosses Jeez. over. <laughs> He's like the same actor playing different characters. In both. Oh, I love that. There's a scene where like Patrick Wilson as like conjuring whatever the fuck his name yeah, is yeah, yeah. meets Patrick Wilson in the ins- Insidious, <laughs> and they like they do the whole thing where they're like matching their movements. Yeah, and they put their hands up. So like, what? It's like Scooby Doo and the Phantom yeah. Menace. Oh no, to do that you would have to age up conjuring Patrick Wilson, wouldn't you? Because they're set in like the 70s and 80s. Yeah, it would have to be some kind of multiverse. Or multiverse. <laughs> that's a good idea, Mark. We need more. That's what. We that's need. one thing the world needs: more multiverses. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, no, we need we need a, a conjuring that crosses over with the uh, Amityville horror because mm. they they did that that case in real life. That's how they they became famous. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What well, I can't remember the names. The Warrens. Like, the Warrens. Yeah, yeah. They're actually involved in the the Amityville haunting, or whatever. Um, and that's the most famous case that they ever did. But uh, there must be rights issues with the actual Amityville star- story. Uh, which is why they don't do it, but they should. They should just buy those rights and then do an Amityville Horror via The Conjuring. That'd be a great movie, I think. I'm sure whatever whatever multi-billion dollar company owns yeah. the fucking Conjuring films could easily buy the rights to that. Just, yeah, buy the rights to a dead franchise that no movie's been made. Well, actually, no, there was a recent Amityville film. Was there? Well, there was dog shit. It was like a low-budget thing, like, you know. Well. Just buy them out. That's what I'd say. <sighs> just, just buy it. Just buy it, Disney. Buy more properties. That's yep. what we need. So the other, the other spooky horror film that I watched, and you also watched this one, Mark. I also watched this. We watched Smile. Smile. A film that went viral because of the really smart marketing that they were doing, where they just had people smiling at the cameras at random spots. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's like the scariest thing in the film. <laughs> that is the scariest thing. No, yeah. do you know what's scarier? Uh, How mid this film is. This is the middest film ever. Yeah. This Smile, film's a joke. Uh, Smile's not that good. It's actually shit. <laughs> Well, it's actually not shit, you know. Not it's just, shit, it's just, shit. it's just okay. Yeah, everything's fine. But it's, it's just it follows. It's a rehash of it follows. Yep. Like beat for beat, everything about it, the themes, like the whole, the whole kind of premise. Yeah, you it's know? like it's like if it follows met the ring. Yeah, 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 yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So it's like trauma, the trauma being passed on through some kind of haunting or like demonic possession through like several different people through like a chain of people and they're all trying to get this curse off of them mm-hmm. uh, get you know they're trying to uh, uh, purge their their trauma yes and the only way to do that is to either kill themselves or kill someone else yeah so this film is about main woman whatever the fuck her name is uh she's a doctor in a psychiatric ward rose and rose and she gets a patient in and the patient's something like no, no, you're not understanding. Like, I'm seeing things. Like, this thing is real. And then she, like, starts smiling. And then she kills herself. And investigation ensues where it's revealed that this this girl that killed herself and smiled witnessed uh, another person that killed himself who smiled, who witnessed another person that killed who witnessed another person, who witnessed another person. It's this whole chain. Mm. And it's Rose trying to break the curse that she has on her. Break the cycle of trauma. But, like... <laughs> So, like, full spoilers for Smile now, because... Yeah, full spoilers. At the end of the film, she faces her trauma, and it doesn't work. Yeah, she, she overcomes her trauma, and it doesn't fucking work. Yeah, I was very confused by that. I was convinced. She faces up to her, like, this, like... good, Pretty the, the best part of the film. Um, dodgy CGI. But, yeah, she faces up to, like, the, uh, the like, monstrous personification of her trauma. So she's, like, well, while she's, like, she's, like... Which is her mother, because she, she, her mother wa- mm. had taken a bunch of pills and called her in to call for help when Rose was, like, 10 years old. And she was, like, Mom, you made a mistake. I need help. Call, call the ambulance. 
and Rose just closed the door. Yeah, yeah. Because she was too afraid. So she closed the door, and then her mom died, and she's been living with that guilt ever since, and that's why she became a psychiatric doctor. Like, it's not even hinted that, that she says that is the reason why. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Everything is just said in the film. There's no subtext whatsoever. Oh, no. they even say, like, this, <laughs> it's like, oh my God, it is passed on through trauma. It's not even like yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> they directly <laughs> say this. Mo- this is a horror film about trauma. Yeah, yeah. She, she goes to a guy who because everyone usually just kills themselves to 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 uh, to lift the curse, whatever. And she finds this guy who who somehow got out of it a different way. Turns out he got out of like by killing someone else and passing it on to like a third party kind of thing. Who witnessed the murder? Who witnessed the murder? Um, and he's he's like he's like he's like in a jumpsuit in jail, and he's like it's passed on through trauma. <laughs> he just explains the whole like kind of like the whole process to it. So like you have to kill somebody else in a really traumatic way, and someone else sees it, so that that person has trauma. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like okay, uh, yeah, I got that. Yeah, I already, I okay. already understood that. You've already explained this through everything else <laughs> in the film. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But she she faces up to her trauma, um, the monstrous form of it, because she's always been followed followed around or sees people who are like smiling and stuff, and just freaking her out. And uh, there's this monster, and it's like it's like it's it's really it's a good. It's initially it's really good because yeah. it just it's just like it splits apart, and it's just like this. It's just like this big kind of creepy like Silent Hill esque monster, like jaws, and like it's like like multiple jaws. It's like it's like the an amalgam of all the people who've been you know a victim of the curse. It's a bit like Beetlejuice, where like it's trying to scare, and it's like oh look at this, I can do something real cool, and like rips open her face. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. yeah it, just, it just rips her face, rips her, it rips her ma's face open. And she faces down this like monstrous avatar of her mom, which is obviously an avatar for trauma. Uh, and like she burns the gaff down and stuff, um, and she defeats her trauma, but it doesn't work. Like it, she she loses in the end. Which yeah, she it's loses. Just, it's just really like it's a horror film, but like it's like, kind of the rules of the game as they're set up. It seems like she should have won. It seems like she should have defeated. What told me was uh, essentially what happened in this, this film. I was just like. So what was the point of everything of her trying to investigate how to defeat this thing? Like, what was the whole point? Because this film is nearly two hours long. Yeah, it's long. It's way it's too long. long. Way too long. It's like, what was the fucking point? So, like, ultimately, thematically, this film is like, you can't... Either you can't overcome your trauma, or the curse isn't about trauma. <laughs> I don't, the, the, That'd be good. Like, there's a sequel it's like actually no that, all, that was all bullshit it's actually about something else is that about, yeah. Yeah, yeah yeah like <laughs> I was just like what like so and then because there is apparently there is going to be a smile too oh fuck that from this point on am I just to assume that the next person who gets it is just fucked and they can't do anything about it yeah you already like, know the ending what, like what's the point because I go such to Jen and Melissa and they're like surely she can't die because that's like what is the point if she just dies mm. and the film ends and she dies like well yeah I guess you can never escape your drama. I, can't, I guess you can't escape your drama, and your drama will just overcome you. Yeah, yeah. Great message, movie. Thanks. Yeah, even like from a moral standpoint, kind of, you know, that's that's kind of that's kind of rough. But it is a horror film. But like, just from like a storytelling standpoint, there is like literally no development whatsoever. Mm. She well, she overcomes her. Uh, well, she does develop, but she's not rewarded or like in any way. Like she develops, she gets she gets over her trauma, physically defeats her trauma in in like you know material form. Burns the, the gaff down like sit, like a sit, the symbolism. It's all there, and uh, no, nothing changes. Yeah, like uh, literally nothing changes at all. Um, and it's not a lot of. It's it's not really. I I I could I could get it more if it's kind of like it was, the kind of hopelessness of the situation was kind of lingered on a bit more by the film. Mm-hmm. But it just it just goes back into the it just ends the the, <laughs> the train of the the, the cycle, yeah. um, and she passes it on to her fella, uh, Joel, Joel. Yeah. And he becomes the next victim of the smile. Of, yeah. But it, it is just, it's beat for beat, it follows. Yeah. Like, beat it's it's pure, like, you have a curse, this thing is going to slowly try and take and you, over and kill you. It, there's a whole seven days thing in it as well. Yeah, there's, like, the you timeline. Seven days. You have, like, it's like, some people survive four, some people survive seven. No one lasts more than a week. So it's like, oh, so we were, we're this. T- oh, so you're ripping off the ring as well. Yeah. yeah, he's like, oh, so you're doing that as well, <laughs> cool. Which is okay. also a better film than this. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, like there's just yeah, like none. It's like an amalgamation of all these other films, and it's even like drawing on like this thing that I think we definitely talked about before. Like I am so fucking sick of horror films and their subtext just being this is a movie about trauma. Yeah, I'm sick of seeing that. Yeah, so so all... this is taking a bunch of shit that I like and taking this 
subtext st- stuff that's in a bunch of films that like some films do it well other films don't and just smashing it all together and giving you the most like unsubtle generic boring fucking movie it's so boring so yeah it's so generic it's painfully generic um and riddled with jump scares yeah, there's a lot of jokes. None scares. of which are very good. Yeah, none, none. I didn't get any. I was watch. I was just watching my room, so I, I didn't. It's not not a great environment, but I didn't really get it, like. There was one good jump scare where she's like leaning and trying to hear something, mm. and then it just goes, Bwah! like literally, just like a ghost roars in her face. <laughs> That's just, just boo. Yeah, that kind of thing, you know. And it's just like, oh, didn't see that coming because <laughs> I was because the sound all drains out. And I was, I, I don't know how I didn't see it coming because all the sound drains out of the film. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like, <laughs> uh, um, it had great marketing, though. It had that. great marketing. Um, great marketing. I thought it was a bit cheesy, though, you know? It's just like, it's just like the smiling. It's beautiful people smiling at you. You know, where, where, where are all the ugly people? They don't you know, exist. Everyone in, horror in this films. film had a beautiful smile. They don't exist in horror films. Where are the people with the fucked up teeth? They're always the monsters. Or bad bites. They're the monsters. They're, They're the monsters. They're the monsters. <laughs> They're the trauma. <laughs> they are physical trauma. Yeah. And even like, I feel like I've seen, it was also kind of like sinister that way as well, where like the ghost makes you brutally murder yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Like I've definitely seen that in something else. Mirrors as well did that. I don't know. It's just a bunch of films where I've seen that. Um. Yeah, I just I watched it and I was like, "What was the point?" Of that? Yeah, actually, uh, that was the, that was the old like it's, it's not a terrible film, but it's just like that was that was a waste of time. Yeah, you know, but like obviously watching for the podcast, so nothing's a waste of time for the most part. But for two the, hours, for the most part. <laughs> <laughs> but two yeah, hours. You watch a film for the podcast, you're like, oh, I've got nothing to say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like, oh, there wasn't even more to watch for the sake of talking about it on the podcast. It's kind of rare. It's surprisingly rare, you know, because usually you can just lay into a film. Um, like if this film wasn't so similar to a lot of other films, we just wouldn't. I wouldn't have anything to say about mm. it. But it is just a rip off of a lot of better films, <laughs> and uh, but it's just so painfully generic. It's not worth watching. Like just no. not worth. No, it's a whole waste of time watching this. Just watch about it. Literally, literally watch the films it's based on. Yeah. Um, watch it follows. Watch it follows. Good film. Good it film. follows so good. Yeah, watching this film made me want to watch <laughs> it follows. Yeah, it did. Yeah. And like it follows is like a very s- fucking slow movie. Um. But that's a lot shorter than this. <laughs> it's it's shorter. It's it's shot better. It's better music. It's it's paced better. It's more atmospheric. Um, it makes more sense. The themes are like not as in your face, but also like way clearer. Mm-hmm. You know. Um, and there's nothing in this film that is more scary than either the tall man coming the through tall the door. Man. The tall man. They have to be tall or really short. Yeah, <laughs> yeah tell you. <laughs> they have to be. You can't be in the middle. You can't be average height. <laughs> you can't eyes. be an average height ghost. <laughs> <laughs> Um, or also the bit where like the ma- where she opens the door and she sees the the mom ghost fucking the the creature fucking the oh god that was yeah, awful yeah, yeah, yeah. I forgot about that until Jen because Jen, Jen was talking about the film and she was like I remember the mom fucks the son to death and I was like what the fuck are you talking about and then I pulled up I was like oh god I forgot <laughs> about that <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah like and that like those aren't even really jump scare like, they just happen mm. like the tall guy just walks into the room uh-huh. and you're like oh. <laughs> you know your monkey brain goes run yeah 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 you just have like this visceral reaction it's not just boo I think that's what smile yeah. is lacking entirely like I think smile is lacking any primal f- fear mm. to it because it is just like I've seen this before it's just, this is not tapping into anything that is in any way like sticking with me it is just a, se- a series of scenes that are like slow build up jump scare and slow build up jump scare and mm. mm-hmm Decent premise, bad execution, mm. terrible execution. Not worth your time. Not nope. worth your time. Um, mid. Mid AF. Yeah. Well, we go for a break, and then we'll talk about Rocky. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. It's the final countdown. did a new new that is not the song to this movie. Feel like it is though. Rocky Balboa. It's the final round. We're swinging for the fences. We're giving it all out. We're giving it's it the all. sixth installment of the Rocky franchise, two thousand and five. I think something around that time. It's around then. Mid two thousands. Rocky Balboa. 
15 ish years in between Rocky 5 and Rocky Balboa. Yeah, let's see. Something like that. We're going to pull up the letterbox <laughs> live on air We're now. Find out. Yeah. Tell you, no research on this podcast. We're going to solve this age old question. Everything is coming off the seat of our pants. 2006, motherfucker. Oh. 16 years. 16 years. I was close to the, I was close to the 16 15. 16 years after Rocky V. Which was dog shit. <laughs> Rocky Balboa. Did you ever know? They never really mentioned his name. In any of the other ones, like his full name. Well, well not when they're doing the, they do the introductions. <laughs> and the challenger in the white corner. Oh, they just go. Rocky Balboa. I didn't notice that at all. Rocky, Rocky, Rocky. Roberts Balboa. That's Roberts. Yeah, no, yeah. <laughs> I didn't know his name was Robert. <laughs> hey, Robert. Bobby Balboa. Hey, Bobby. Yeah, no, this is an amazing hey, film. Yep. Uh, Big Rock. As. As predicted, when we set off in this venture, we thought Rocky 1-4 to four was going to be good, Rocky 5 was going to dip, Rocky Babo was going to come back up, and we predicted correctly. As always. As always. Never wrong on this podcast. We've never once been wrong about any film, because it's all subjective. Yes, exactly. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> except for when we accidentally, you know, provide information that is actually incorrect. Yeah, except for when we spread misinformation. Uh, Rocky Balboa, what is it's a, it's a very cathartic, very cathartic film. It's a great comeback. It's kind of like the actual arc of like a disgraced boxer's career is like replicated in the arc of the Rocky franchise, isn't it? You know? Oh like my god, gone, you're right. Yeah, you know, <laughs> and even like the, the, his actual career itself, like uh, Stallone's career, starts out. It's kind of like. You know, like a serious actor. I remember, I remember so surprised by how good he was in the first two films. Becomes a bit of a parody. Three and four, five. He's he's in the fucking doldrums. It's he's ass. fucked. He's on. He's eating ass. <laughs> he's, he's eating he's a lot of ass. Eating ass. <laughs> he's eating ass and sucking his own dick. <laughs> <laughs> no one else will, because he's just so up his own hole. He's on the mat, as they say. You know, and the countdown's happening. And the countdown lasted a long sixteen years. Uh, this is his great comeback. This is when he stands back up, does a Tyson Fury or a Rocky Balboa, as uh, you know, more appropriate. <laughs> he stands back. <laughs> he stands back up, and he comes back. He goes down swinging in his final film, which is apparently not going to be his final film. He's working on another one. Wait, he, he's in Rocky. He's in Creed one, two, and three. He's in every Creed, is he? Yeah, I thought he, he was only in Creed one. No, he's uh, he's Creed's trainer. So ah. I'm sure I'm sure he's in two and three. Yeah, and um, but yeah, this is a it's a great comeback, and it's 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 very. Uh, it's really cathartic just in... It turns out how it fits into the series. It, it kind of retroactively justifies how bad the fifth one was. Yeah. Um, it's almost thematic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it also kind of... It also justifies... Because it turns into a circus, obviously, around three and four. It justifies that. It's kind of like... It's more of like an interlude or like a an oxbow lake within the realm of the of the... You know, it's like it's not really... It's just kind of like it's a it's a fun little side quest yeah. rather than kind of like a sad denigration of an originally very serious mm-hmm. uh, series, um, and it captures the first one like the kind of the, the seriousness and the oh yeah this is straight back to being a social drama again yeah yeah the social drama the realism of the first one, um, you actually believe that you know this guy's a real person because he somehow like lost every everything that he had pretty much okay okay so I understand that like sports pundits will. You know, talk shit about people, uh, just to, you know, drum up hype and stuff like that. But one of the fu- one of the sports pundits in this, when they're like discussing the the fight, he's like, "Rocky's a bum. He's a he's a loser, or whatever." And I was like, "This fella fought for America in yeah. Moscow. <laughs> Surely this guy should be like a a national hero." Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was just a comical interlude. Um, yeah, no, they really went. To, yeah, that one guy went really hard on it for no reason, <laughs> just like just out of nowhere. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> he's a bum. He's 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 a nobody. He's a fucking husband. It's like, I really, yeah, he's, he's like seventy years yeah, old. Yeah, I feel like, I feel like <laughs> of course a he's a husband. I feel like you have a bit more respect for Rocky. <laughs> <laughs> it's like imagine they're saying about like Muhammad Ali. He's like they're shaking with Parkinson's. He's a husband. He's a, he's a nobody. He's, he's a bum. <laughs> I feel like fucking. Uh, I kept saying CRT in the last Rocky film. Yeah, CRT, no? No, it's not. CRT is the TVs, bro. <laughs> oh. What's what is it? it? Cranio trauma. Yeah, it's just cranio trauma. It's just CT. It's that's not. A, that's bullshit, man. It's not CT or I could have t- sworn it was a CT or. It's, yeah. yeah. I don't know why CT or is my brain, in, my, in my brain, strange it, enough. It's in my brain as well. <laughs> strange enough. But, um, no, it's a CT. It's just. 
It's not CRT. CRT is the... What's the one in Roby? HRT? I have no idea. Sure, yeah. Do a quick Google. HRT. Patches, benefits, not medication, meaning. What is it? Hormone replacement therapy. Oh. No, I don't think it's that. <laughs> 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 um, yeah, no, well, that's bullshit anyway. But yeah. Yeah, no, well, he, yeah. But he's he has a CT. He's a CT. Like, what the fuck is wrong with these people? He's a CTI. 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 Injury. That's what it that's, is. That's, yeah. Anyway, case solved. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> 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 the of the crate. I'm not going to Google because I don't want to be wrong again. So we're going to go TTI. I'm going to take uh, another one. <laughs> it's, I'm not taking another hit. I'm not taking another hit to the face with that one. <laughs> um, yeah, but he seems like he's he's cured in this film because. Okay, so the plot in this one is Rocky. He just owns he owns Adrian's. He's a he owns a restaurant. He's an old legend in Philadelphia. He's still in the streets. Um, he's living a just a a random gaff and um he comes across little katie or whatever the fuck her name was um the girl oh the girl in the, yeah. in the very first film that i completely forgot was a character <laughs> um and um i was i was worried i was real worried when she was established i was like yeah, yeah oh god please don't don't be like a romantic interest and then the very next scene he's like i'm not interested in you in that way whatsoever and she was like oh yeah i didn't think that and he's like okay god i just want to make that clear <laughs> yeah that was, was that like, was whew, we were murky water there for a second <laughs> yeah that, they could have fallen at the first hurdle there yeah you know could have fallen at the first hurdle but it leapt over leapt over very quickly established this is not romantic <laughs> yeah yeah he's just he's just a, he's just a nice guy this is a nice guy yeah rock and Polly's at sorry the so the bad this one bumps into little Katie whatever her fucking name is she's older now he's taking care of her he just doesn't really have much going on and decides I want to do like low level boxing I just want to do low level boxing um but then the sports pundits and stuff like that take uh, a computerized version of him and scale it and match it up against the current world champion who's Mason name Dixon. Mason the Line Dixon. Mason he actually sounds Mason Dixon sounds like a boxer. Yeah. It's yeah. a great boxing name. Um who is like this he's the current world champion, but he's not respected because boxing is fucking dead. Like it's not as big as it was when Rocky was a champ, which is you know, real life is also fucking true. Um and uh, he gets his license to be able to just do small time boxes and Mason Dixon's promoters and stuff like that. Like, here, come on, Rocky, we'll just do an exhibition match. Come mm. on, like, just do it. Let's make it. We'll do it for charity. Do it for the kids. <laughs> and Rocky's like, all right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But he's falling into like he's dealing again with the same issues that he did in the first one. You know, yeah. he's come back around. It's a cycle, and he, he's 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 reached the same point again where he's kind of like he's. A massive, massive underdog because he's just an old guy. Like, yeah, he's, he's just an old, old man. as fuck, and he doesn't want to be humiliated. He feels like he doesn't want to be an exhibition, but he doesn't want to be exhibited. You know, as kind of a mm-hmm. freak. You know, and he wants to be to fair. Up. He shows off. He's a freak, bro. Yeah. How do you take that many shots? He's a, <laughs> he's a genetic freak because he's like sixty in this film, and he's like he's jacked. He's as big as he was. In, I think he's, he's bigger. I think he's I think bigger, he, man. He's more like. I think he has that old man strength in this uh, combined with just being fucking jacked. <laughs> yeah, he's got those his fists like shovels. You know, he's got the he's got the roid skull. You know, his skull has gotten larger. Mm. You know, but his hat barely fits him anymore. <laughs> sad. <laughs> it's, it's sad. <laughs> <laughs> he is jacked. Um, so he just wants to go out there. It's it's a replay of the first premise in the first film. He just wants to go out there, give a good account of himself. And come back with a bit of dignity, um, you know. And if they play it off really well, it's not a rehash at all. No, you know they play it off really well. It accounts for everything that's happened since. It's kind of his status, you know, kind of the fallen star ish. Um, he was just kind of bored. He's nothing to do, mm, and like everyone's kind of either like Polly, like Polly, but bi- like by logic, Polly should be just like chilling. The same way Rocky is. Yeah. But Polly's still working in the slaughterhouse. Yeah. I and know. he's like, this is all I got, you know? It's like, it's like, like how is that all you have? I like the way that they established, like, because Polly's always just kind of been there. And, like, in this film, it is literally his 
his character arc is that he's just always been there. He hasn't really done all that much. He never did anything major in the films. And this film, it's a reflection on that, that he never really did anything. Mm. And in this film, he gets fired from the slaughterhouse. He has literally nothing. And Rocky's just like, come on, Polly, let's let's do this. Let's, let's fucking prove ourselves that we can do something. You know, help me train. We can we can do this. We're old, but we we still got it. Yeah. There's still there's still fire in that basement. Um, <laughs> and Polly has like this nice fucking character arc in the film as well. But for the first fucking time, yeah, has, yeah, yeah. Polly has a point in these films. He actually is. He's not just a sidekick, kind of. Yeah. Um, it was funny when he's like, "Oh, it's because it's like, why are you so sad? Because Adrian left you. It's like she died. She Polly. died, Polly. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> is your sister?" <laughs> Polly, what the hell? And Polly's like, I don't want to ever think about her because you got to be good to her, but I was never good to her. Yeah, yeah. There's, al- there's a lot of great lines. Even the thing about um, like if uh, you stay in one place long enough, you become that place. You know, mm. the, the way it's kind of used like three or four times uh, as like a, like a motif or whatever. It's 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 a it's a good. I don't know if Stallone actually wrote this, but it's a good line, and the the the, the, the film is full of good lines. Yeah, it's a very well written film. Mm. Um. I, th- my, I think my favorite line in the film is uh, is Rocky just in a in the in the bar and someone's like um, Rocky, whatever happened to Adrian or whatever or like how did she? Oh yeah, I heard that she died. Uh, he did write this film. He wrote it. Yeah, he wrote it. Well done. Um, how did uh, how did you know what happened to Adrian? And he just like really nonchalantly goes like, she died of the woman cancer, which is just like <laughs> such a Rocky moment. <laughs> it's just like. I mean that is that is, to be fair that is how Rocky would would explain how she <laughs> died of cancer. <laughs> <laughs> the woman cancer. I do miss Adrian in this movie, uh, but that's kind of because Rocky misses her as well. Yeah, yeah you feel his, his his pain, you know, his, his anguish. Like if she was around, this film would be it would really remove from like it would detract from the emotional gravitas, you know, the weight. Oh, like Seriously, it. even because at the end, he's like, "Yo, Adrian." We did it. Yeah, yeah, oh. yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's good. It's very. It's like it's it's a it, it's it really it tickles all those little, all those little things that you want to be tickled. Mm-hmm. In a, yeah, tickles the taint just how I like it. In a yeah, <laughs> <laughs> in like a reboot. The movie taint. <laughs> <laughs> in like a reboot or like a rehash or whatever. Like that's it's it's it's, it's what you want. Uh, while like, while also building obviously on like everything that's happened before, uh, but like the film's already kind of struggling with having to balance his son as well because mm. he's in the film um, and he's basically just only in the film to serve as a setup to Rocky's great speech the which is best fucking movie speech ever well, yeah honestly one of the greatest modern speeches in in a film it's re- really well done very it, like in, even in context it's like a, or it's it's more powerful in context mm. like within the context of the film and um, but like the, the son's character like Robert Balboa Jr he's uh, he's just kind of there to serve as like kind of a like an inspiration for that speech, mm-hmm. and then as soon as he hears his speech, because uh, because he, he's working as like a, a banker or something like that, he's working yeah, in an like, office job, yeah. some like a uh, like normal office job, and he's kind of he's like kind of embarrassed by his dad's legacy, uh, he, like watching him on TV. He casts a very large shadow. Yeah, serious shadow on this guy, and he's very resentful of his dad because of that. And his dad I misses him. Never own. be my own man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's he's living in the shadow. He wants to be his own man, but like he's resentful of his dad because of that fact. His dad wants to get close to him, but there's always kind of this tension there. And then Rocky, you know, just splurges out with this like, insane speech, like just on the on the he's street. More articulate in this film <laughs> than he's been in any of the others. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> just like just randomly on the street in the middle of the night, um, and the son immediately is just like, yeah, whatever, okay. To, to be fair, yeah, yeah, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Bro, if I heard that, I'm like, yeah, no, I'm down. I'm, I'm fucking down. What, that, that, what do you want to do, Dad? Hearing a speech like that, that would change my life. <laughs> <laughs> and I love that. Like, I I love as well. Like, Stallone knows that that speech is banging because when Rocky gets knocked down really hard, the montage yeah. in 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 the in the fight, you hear the lines. What did you do, the kid? It's not about how hard you get hit. It's about how hard you get hit and keep moving forward. And he gets back up and the crowd is chanting, Rocky, Rocky. As yeah. like, oh. like, God, what, like, like, this Rocky franchise has made me realize that, like, if a formula fucking works, stick to the formula. Stick to the formula. You don't need to change it if it works. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> Don't. Yeah. Fix what ain't broke. <laughs> it's yeah, it's a very simple setup, very simple premise. 
and uh, it works. It works. It works really well. And yeah, there's there's a lot of there's good montage as well. Oh, which, the, which, you, which you need in a Rocky the film. Fucking, the fucking, the training montage in this one's great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But they're, they're tasteful, you know. They're, yeah. they're tastefully made, tastefully placed, like the first one. Not like Rocky 3, which is what, 30, three, like a third is just montage. Rocky 4, please. Rocky 4, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, uh, but like, yeah, they're, they're very, like the training montage is really well done. Like the, the steps, all the callbacks, the mm. dog. Uh, is What's his dog's name? Punch. Like, Punchy. Punchy, yeah. Yeah, yeah, punchy. <laughs> I really like the kid character in this film as well, the teenager. Steps, yeah, yeah. Oh, uh, he's yeah. A good, I like him. He's good, yeah, because yeah, Rocky wins him over, like... It's, very it's very a, fucking easily as well. Yeah, very easy, but it is, like, it's kind of a... It seems like a very real, like, realistic kind of relationship for, like... A man to those, have with a random teenager. Yeah, those characters <laughs> to have with each other. It's just, like, he just doesn't like Rocky. He seems kind of strange, and then Rocky wins him over and by d- being kind of, like, an, like, a dumbass. Yeah. You know? By being a very lovable dumbass. Yeah, yeah, Which yeah. is, like, that is Rocky's, like, uh, highest or best characteristic. He's a bit like... <laughs> um, in One Piece, uh, Luffy, the main character of One he's Piece, he's like Luffy. <laughs> he's, he's a lovable dumbass. Yeah, yeah. That can yeah. just get people on his side, and that's what Rocky does as well. Uh-huh. Um, yeah, it's. Just, I really, I, I'm a big fan of that, that character type. It's just lovable dumbasses who are kind and will kick the shit out of you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the thing. Yeah, he's, he's, he's not. He's he's a gentle giant. Mm. Even though he's not that tall, but. Um, oh yeah, geez, he's real short compared to me. <laughs> Jesus Christ! Yeah. Um, the film was praised for like how because apparently the, the 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 series prior to this was kind of famous for how bombastic like the the boxing scenes are. Mm-hmm. Like there's like like you, you they get hit with a dig and there's like this pow yeah it's like sound yeah effects. literally like fucking like comic books <laughs> yeah and they like they don't uh, block or anything like that yeah. you know? and this film was was praised for like how realistic the the, the fighting scenes were. But they really aren't that realistic Fight in this at all. It looks like shit. It looks fucking terrible. Like, like it, it actually, it does. Like it, it's shot as if it was a boxing match you've seen on TV. But like you can, like if you've actually ever watched a boxing match, you'd be like, this is not, like yeah. this is not how like it works at all. No. Like like Rocky gets hit and he just he like does it like a full one eighty, or like dives across the the mat, um, and the sound effects are all on point. But like it just it just looked ridiculous. Yeah. For the first while. Like I don't like this, the. Critiques I have this film, like most of them are fairly minor. One of them is that like I did kind of expect the boxing to look good in this film because yeah, it's yeah, yeah. it's a it's a it's a modern film. I don't like it looks better than the other Rocky movies, but yeah. that's not saying much. That's not a lot, yeah. <laughs> like that is not saying a lot. Um, yeah, I just yeah, I, I this is the one fucking Rocky film as well where Mason Dixon, like I you know I like Apollo Creed. You know, in two, you're somewhat sympathetic towards uh, Apollo Creek because you can understand where he's coming from. Again, in this film, more much more so than in any of the other films, you really see where Mason Dixon's coming from, and you do kind of. I was sympathizing for him. I felt bad for Mason Dixon because, like, I hate him. It's not his fault that <laughs> boxing was shit. Um, <laughs> although when he was when he was saying to Rocky, like, "Listen, old man, like." You know, if you if you try and hit me, I will put you down. Mm. I was like, "Go fuck yourself." Don't yeah, talk, yeah, yeah. Don't talk to Rocky yeah, that way. Fuck you, Mace. Don't you talk to Rocky that way? <laughs> um, and I like as well that they do establish like how Rocky gets a fighting chance in the boxing match is Mason breaks his hand. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. there's like okay, because I was expecting just Rocky just to make a show of this guy, but no, he like he broke his arm, he broke his hand. Which is like the whole point of Mason Dixon as well is that like he's never had to proper have like a fight. Like he's never had to like dig down deep mm. and like struggle against someone and he's getting hit by Rocky Bobo, who they established like even now and like they actually it's in the training as well where the the trainer's like you have you won't have the speed, you won't have the agility, but you could have the punching power. Mm. Where like if you hit him it's going to be like getting hit with a shotgun. Mm. Like, that's the one thing that you have against Mason Dixon. So he's getting pounded by Rocky and also has a broken hand. So it's like he he, re- he redeems himself and shows himself to be a fighting champion. Yeah, yeah. Like, it is... I got a bit of slack for being unrealistic as well. In this, like, just the general plot. But I found, like, it was set up fairly well. Oh, yeah. Like, it is obviously the whole idea of, like, a six-year-old man, like, fighting, like, a champion heavyweight. Um is like unrealistic but the way it's it is set up like they're very like yeah you don't have a chance unless you 
you know, you get lucky and follow this very specific mm-hmm. kind of tactic. Um, and yeah, then your man breaks his hand. And like the whole, it, it is cool, as you say, like like, like Mason Dixon isn't like a, of like a full blown villain. Yeah. He's just kind of. He's a bit like Apollo. He's like Apollo. Yeah. He's just kind of in, he's in a, I don't know, a tough spot. And he's not, he doesn't have anything against Rocky. He's just like. It's not personal. Yeah. He's just, just business. It's just business. It's just business. It's, well, it's for charity. Mm-hmm. Um. So like yeah, it, tax write offs. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> so you're not like you're not like oh, this guy's an evil communist or like this guy killed Mick. You this, know, this guy isn't like, whatever the fuck Tommy was in the fifth <laughs> film. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. This guy hasn't betrayed Rocky for Don King. Um, so like it's more down to earth, and you're more just rooting. It's more like a, a positive thing where you're just rooting for Rocky mm-hmm. rather than being like we need to take this guy down. Yeah, um, which is more realistic, um, and like. It, it pays off really well. It's very cathartic. I also appreciate the fact that it doesn't... You don't... It's not like... It's like, the, again, going back to the first one, it's not like, oh, Rocky just comes back and somehow defeats uh, like all the odds mm-hmm. and wins yeah. against someone he should have no right to win against whatsoever. Um, like, he just comes to a split decision. Mm-hmm. It's all about Rocky retaining his dignity. There's yeah. nothing about... Like, he doesn't need to win the fight. He just wants to go out there, give a good account of himself. Um I feel good about himself after the fight. Do yeah. his family proud, his friends proud, all that stuff. Show it that he's he can still he can still do it. Yeah, yeah. He still has the spirit to yeah. do it. You know, not necessarily. He probably, yeah, at this stage, he's so old. Doesn't have the even in the first one. He's he's, he's established as being extremely old for a professional <laughs> boxer <laughs> in the first movie. Um, so he doesn't have the physical facilities to uh, mm-hmm. accomplish what he wants to do, but he has the spirit and he has the the, the inner strength. Um, and it's accomplished very well. At that's the end even of the film. that's even more so in this one because in the first one, like I don't think you even hear the results call out because that's not what it's about. In this mm. film, they're calling out the results and Rocky isn't even in the ring. He's like, I fucking did it. I don't he care. Just, just walks off. Yeah, yeah, I'm gone. <laughs> <laughs> nah, it's good. It's great. It's, it's, good. Good. it's a good film. Where would you? Right, where's your ranking of all the Rocky movies? Rocky one, Rocky. Oh, I don't know. It's tough. This is a Rocky Balboa and Rocky Two. This is a yeah no. This is like the the tightest that I would put these movies. Like I think this is the closest franchise that we've done. Yeah, yeah. like except for Rocky Five. Except for Rocky Five, but all the other ones are very like Rocky Three is clearly like not as good as the other four, but not a million miles off. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not it's not terrible. Yeah, you know, it's not a bad film, but it's a totally different type of film. I'd say honestly, I go Rocky Two and then Rocky Balboa. But, like, there's not a lot between the three, I'd say. Yeah. You know? Like, all together. Like, you kind of switch that around in any way. It would make sense to me. Mm-hmm. Uh, then Rocky... Rocky 4. And Rocky 3. And then whatever. Fair. <laughs> yeah, not fair. I'm just like... I, I I love the stupidity of Rocky 5. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I go Rocky. Uh-huh. Rocky 5. What? Again, Rocky 2 and Rocky Baba are very close. Very close. Very close. I'm going to say Rocky Balboa. Yeah. But only by a smidge. Rocky 2, uh, Rocky 3, Rocky 5. Rocky 5 is the second. No, no. Reverse. Like, Rocky 5 is at the bottom. Sorry, Rocky 4 is oh, the second. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, Rocky 4 sense. is the second film. Yeah, yeah. Rocky 5 <laughs> is the bottom. Okay. okay. <laughs> yeah, I think I missed her, though. Um, no, I think you're right. I think I, I don't think I said that right. I was, I was, I was, I was, I was aghast. Yeah, no. No, Rocky, <laughs> Rocky 1, Rocky 5. Rocky Balboa, Rocky Two, mm. Rocky Three, Rocky Five. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, that's um, solid, yeah. solid ranking. Like, but like again, there's not those four films are very close. Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. there's only like like even if I rewatch these films in a different way, you know, maybe I get maybe when I get older, get to Rocky's age, <laughs> Rocky Five, Rocky Rocky Balboa might be second favorite. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, oh, no, man, man, maybe maybe the fucking speeches. I don't think Rocky fought Rocky Bobo up to second place. That speech is that so speech good. That speech is great. It's great. Oh, great. Catharsis. The, the cultural impact it's had in such a short, short space of time. There's so many like YouTube motivational videos oh, that is yeah, just yeah, like yeah, this yeah. this yeah. clip. <laughs> uh, Andrew Tate, Rocky, uh, Joe Rogan, <laughs> uh, you know, those other guys. Um, those other like fitness influencers. Who's your man? Isn't David the, Goggins. David Goggins, yeah, yeah. dude, the Marine, yeah, the yeah, yeah. Mount Rushmore. <laughs> yeah, 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 the Mount, Mount Rushmore. Oh, really problematic. <laughs> <for Max Kennedy. laughs> of toxic motivational <laughs> speakers. <Yeah. laughs> Rocky's most wholesome of them all. Yeah. You know. 
Uh, but yeah, no, great, great film. Great mm, film. Great film. Great. I don't know. Oh, man, I think that's the best franchise we've done easily. Mm, no, in terms of tightness and quality, yeah, yeah, definitely. Like, I can't think of... I can't, I'm trying to think of ones that... Uh, Alien all over the shop. Oh, all over the place. All over the place. Um, Shrek just falls apart after all two. All over the place. Falls apart after two. Um, Halloween. Halloween falls all apart. To, all over the place after falls the first apart one. after the first movie. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, what else yeah. have we done? We did um, Twilight. Pretty consistent, but in a different way. Um, Re- uh, Resident Evil was pretty consistent. Yeah. But I don't think any of them reached the heights of like the first... You know, maybe Rocky one, two. Oh God, no. <laughs> They'd be more in the realm of Rocky three and four, mm-hmm. uh, which is a different kind of thing. But they're very consistent, I think. Oh yeah. You know, I think we did another franchise, but I can't think of them. We definitely have pretty one, pretty good. Yeah. Oh, Texas Chainsaw fell apart after the first one. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Um, though that was interesting. That was. That was in, in a very different way. I think looking at the, looking at how we do these things, maybe we should. St- Stay away from horror franchises. I think so. The data <laughs> is telling us to stay a lot, away. A lot of horror franchises fall apart after the first the one. First film, the first hurdle. Maybe the second one might be all right, but Jesus. Yeah, we're not Rock, Rockies. Rockies is a, a big surprise. Big surprise for me. Um, I might watch Creed at some point, but I don't know. I've seen Creed before. You've seen it. I but these films haven't been like because because they're so formulaic. They're comfy in how formulaic they are. Mm. That like I could just kind of just watch Creed and just be like at peace. At peace, you know, it's an easy watch, mm. an enjoyable easy watch. I actually think as well, Creed really focuses on getting actually good boxing into it. Yeah, yeah. like having an actual boxer in them. <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah. At least in the first one, I don't know if there's an actual boxer in the second one. I don't think so. Uh then, like this, the, I remember seeing the ads for Creed Three and just talking about like I want to want a boxing match in IMAX. It seemed like yeah. pretty realistic, you know. Yeah, it's like the that first was our whole selling point. You yeah, know? which is, I don't really know if I wanted to see a boxing match in IMAX. Yeah, okay. I don't really care if I. Yeah, you know, don't need that much. But I don't know. I'll watch it maybe some point in the future. Yeah, some point. The first one at least. Maybe uh, we'll return to this later on in the year. I'd like, yeah, I'd like a, I'd like a Rocky Seven though. I'd like a Rocky Seven. Same. You know, see what happens. I do not know what what, what you can do with this. Do? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just does Rocky Balboa again? <laughs> <laughs> Dude, this time I'm even older. Because <laughs> now it's been it's been it's been seventeen years. Yeah. I think it's, he's due a sequel. Jeez, it's been seventeen years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now, to be fair, there's the Creed movies. Yeah. Which yeah. was like, oh, Rocky's back. Yeah, but like he wasn't really though. <laughs> he wasn't really. Um. Because there's 16 years between Rocky Five and Rocky Six, Rocky Seven is like on the cards. Has to be on the cards, you know. But like, I'm yeah, sure. don't, don't know what he wrote about. I'm sure somewhere in Hollywood there's a whiteboard with Rocky Seven. There is. It's, it is in development. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it, there is something up there. <laughs> Someone's pitching that idea around in Hollywood. Just, just Sylvester Stallone. Yeah, just, <laughs> it's just Stallone. It's, it's like, like oh, this can, guy again. <laughs> listen, I can every take a, week. I can take a load of steroids <laughs> and get huge again. Trust me. <laughs> <laughs> I can yeah. do it. Put me in. <laughs> That'd be, in, coach. that'd be his thing. And he dies at the end of Rocky 7. But then he dies in real life because all the steroids fucked up his heart. Don't do it, Stallone. It's not <laughs> worth it. <laughs> Don't do it. Because <laughs> it is just him, you know? Oh, God. His it's, last will and testament. His franchise has maybe been like, oh, man, I love Sylvester Stallone. Yeah, no, yeah. He's, he's, he actually is a good actor. I prefer, I do prefer uh, Arnie, but Stallone is a fucking close second yeah I definitely prefer Arnie I, I still have a few reservations but still, like all the expendables what the fuck was he thinking about <laughs> <laughs> what was he thinking if Arnie does have those Terminator sequels well pretty much everything after Rocky what what is Sylvester Stallone doing like Rambo yeah um I think we talked about this before god I have no idea he what hasn't else done he's anything on. really I don't think I can not really think of Stallone's like iconic movies Mm. I think we did do this, but I've already forgotten, so that just tells a lot. Yeah, yeah. I don't oh, he did that uh, Demolition Man. Demolition Man. Oh, he was in, he was in Guardians of the Galaxy, was he? I didn't know that. Um, oh, Ants. He? Oh, shit. He was in Ants and Sp- Spy Kids 3D. Oh, never mind. <laughs> never mind. Never mind. <laughs> Fucking hold the phone. <laughs> yeah, Rambo movies. Judge Dredd. Ah, uh, okay. Death Race 2000. <gasps> Grudge Match. Stallone oh my god man we should do that movie what is it it's fucking 
Sylvester Stallone as a boxer taking on Robert De Niro, who's a separate boxer, but it's not Raging Bull versus uh, Rocky. <laughs> That'd be good, yeah. Oh my god, we should do that. Let's do that. Let's do it. Henry Razor Sharp versus Billy the Kid. Meet down. Why Billy is the kid. is Robert De Niro have any Irish blood in him? No, I think he's just Italian, boy. Because he plays a lot of a lot of Irish. A lot of Irish. Italians and Irish are the same thing. We are very similar. You know. We are similar people. You know, we both have mafias in the US, both from Europe. He's actually more Irish, I suppose. Well, why is that spelled like that? Of De Niro's four grandparents, three were of Irish ah. ancestry. Okay. He even traveled around Ireland as a teenager in the 1960s. His father was half Irish. His mother was Helen O'Reilly. Okay, that makes more... Imagine, oh, imagine okay. Robert O'Reilly. That could have been his real name. Damn, what a name. <laughs> okay, so I'm guessing, like, his paternal grandparent was Italian. But he looks so Italian. He looks so <laughs> Italian. Like, that is not a, mi- that is not a mick head on him. He, he does not have an Irish head, yeah, yeah. Okay, so he's more Irish than he's Italian. Well, you know, but he's more Irish than he's Italian. He's more so Irish. In, yeah. his, in his hereditary genes. How did you know that? How did I know what? You just had a feeling. Like. Oh, because he's playing. I'm fairly certain. Um, isn't isn't Rage and Bull? He's um. He's an Irish. He's yeah. Irish in that. He's in the Irish man. Um, <laughs> he is the Irish. He man. is the Irish man. I also for I confused him as um being in um. Uh, uh the the fucking what are they called? What's that fucking Scorsese film? Godfather. The Departed. The Departed. But that's ah, Jack yeah. Nicholson. <laughs> <laughs> ah, they're all the same. Jack Nicholson's Irish as well, yeah. Um, I don't know why. I just, I think, I think, I think, quite literally, just looking at the name Mc McConnell, and that was like, he's not fucking Irish. Why is he playing an Irish person <laughs> or McDonnell? Yeah, let's watch that. Is that Kevin Hart? No, that is Kevin Hart. Is it? Jesus. There's someone in this film called Ireland Baldwin. <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, Alec Baldwin's daughter. No way! Yeah, yeah, yeah. Didn't know that. That's gas. Ireland, it's just, we're just everywhere. We are just everywhere. We just dominate. That's interesting. Okay, maybe oh, two hours. <laughs> two hours. Uh, we'll, 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 we'll watch it. Top rated letterbox review. I haven't seen Rocky. I haven't seen Ranger Bull, but I've seen Grudge Match. What we can do, but you know, Mark, you know what, Mark? This movie, I feel like, is for us. It is. It is made for us. Uh, we've done. Oh, like look at look at the cast. Raging, Raging Bull was one of our recommended films as well, actually. It was, yeah. It wasn't very good though. No. Um, John Bernthal. LL Cool J. LL making, Cool J. Making a return after being in which Halloween movie was he in? Halloween H two O. Oh, he's back. <laughs> <laughs> he's back on the Parapod. Um, Kim Basinger. Yeah, it's, that's a that's a that's a bizarre cast. Joey Diaz is in this movie. <laughs> <laughs> no way. We have to watch that. Oh, man. We should watch this. Yeah, we'll watch that for next episode. Yeah. Stick, it, stick it on the list. Yeah. You know what? It's on the watch list now. Let's go. Grudge let's match. Go. Grudge match. Okay. Cross out. The multiverse has started. Yeah. Fucking. Yeah. That's a proper multiverse there. <laughs> I love the way that they're just like, let's make a boxing match again with Stallone and De Niro in it. Yeah, <laughs> just because yeah. they were in two very famous, two the famous two most boxing. famous boxing movies. It's about how Rocky's just so much better than Raging Bull as well. Even though Raging Bull is trying to you know, deal with proper issues. <laughs> yeah, Raging Bull's really artsy. Yeah, it's over its own hole. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't great. Rocky's for the people. Rocky, yeah, Rocky's about, it was about, the, it was about the American people, the spirit. It's about you know? the fighting spirit. It's about the fight. Uh, but yeah, let's move on to our recommended, recommended movie. It is Can Dialectics Break Bricks? I want you to pronounce the French name. La dialectique. Putel casse de brique. De brique. Question mark. De brique. Uh, directed by René Vienne. And, yeah. Directed oh, by I imagine that's... And Tu Quang Chi. Who I imagine... Who had no part in the actual yeah, movie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was yeah. like, who the fuck... Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, this is a mad experimental film. It can be very... It's kind of hard to explain, but I will... Letterbox has provided us with a very rough explanation. Uh, a Kong Kong... Why does it say Kong Kong? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It actually does say it Kong says, Kong. I thought you fucked up with that. Like, no, it does say Kong Kong. <laughs> um, I need to read these for a start. A Hong Kong martial arts movie redoed by situationist Rene Viennet. 
Uh, the narrative focuses on a conflict between proletarians and bureaucrats within state capitalism. The proletarians enlist their grasp of dialectics in the fight against their oppressors, while the bureaucrats defend themselves against a combination of co-optation and violence. I'm or using a... Co- you, know, you know, you know what I mean. You know what I mean. What I'm trying to see is Kong Kong a thing. No, it's not. <laughs> King it, Kong it's, immediately it's came a, up. It's just a typo. It's just a typo. Because no one has ever seen this film. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> not enough people have seen uh, this. It has, to make it, change. Has, it has six fans on Letterboxd. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so this is, a, this is a bit of a deep cut in the sense that I had never heard of this film until we were like, we were like, we were on a derive. We were on a, we were on a, a, a hunt for a recommended film a few weeks ago. It was probably a few months ago now. And I just came up on like a list, some random list I was, I was looking at. And I was like, that, that sounds kind of interesting. Uh, a Hong Kong martial arts film redubbed in, in the sense of a detournement um, in the spirit of like the situationists. Um, and they redub it to make it very, very, I don't know, political. Uh, very to, political. To, to express their ideas. Uh, so yeah, the situationists were a movement, a philosophical political movement in France, mainly based out of France in the 60s who... We have probably talked about it before a few times in the podcast. Yeah, probably very briefly. I, yeah. I actually, re- I don't really understand the situation. Is, to be honest, yeah, like it's, it's something that I've like read about quite a few times, but I've never been able to crack into actually what the fuck they're on about. Yeah, so it's like it's like a cult based around Guy Debord, who is uh, the author of Society of the Spectacle, which I've read twice and I barely understand. It's extremely <laughs> difficult to read, <laughs> it, even though it's, it's like it's like uh, it's it's presented in aphorisms. So yeah, it's like there's bullet bites. points. Yeah, these bullet points. He's like these bite-sized uh, philosophical points. Um, but it's still very difficult to kind of like piece together because um, the language is very dense and the, the idea is very abstract. But anyway, was, the situations were kind of based around this guy, Guy Debord, who started, um, he became politically active after the war in France and he was active all through the, si- the 60s and stuff like that. And the situations were kind of like these anarchists or like libertarian socialists who were against the West, but also against the East. They hated the Soviets. Like, you're all wrong. Yeah, they're like, yous are all wrong, we're right. Me and these other ten guys. Classic French. Yeah, 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 very French. Like, extremely French people. Um, and they're, obviously, they, they were very focused on kind of media theory and, uh, you know, mediatization and the spectacle and how capitalism uses the spectacle to kind of obscure the... Uh, whatchamacallits, the contradictions and the different uh, tensions in the capitalist system, but also how they, they, they kind of analyze the Soviet Union as a state capitalist institution where there was capitalism, but it was just kind of like enforced from the top down mm-hmm. um, via the state as a vehicle um, for oppression. So they analyzed the Soviets in a very similar way. Um, and so they their whole kind of ethos was to approach political um, agitation through the lens of like play basically mm-hmm. so they did they dedicated themselves to loads of pranks um and the idea behind the pranks would be to kind of like pull back the curtains you know, like wizard of oz style to expose the uh the inner workings beneath you know mm-hmm. to pull up the hood and you see everything gets fucked up underneath it uh, so like they'd have they, they started the whole like the idea of kind of like parodying advertisements yeah uh stuff like that like they they'd have like a like a, an ad for smoking and they'd go up there and be like you know, do something about how smoking kills you. Oh, so they're um, Banksy, are they? Ba- mm? Bans- yeah, Banksy. like yeah, like Banksy, yeah, yeah. Banksy, Banksy, Banksy. Yeah, Jesus. yeah, yeah. <laughs> like Banksy, but more like yeah, like an actual political motive. Um, and way more pretentious. Yeah, if way po- if possible. Way, way <laughs> more pretentious. Um, they books and all, and <laughs> they way were, more pretentious. They had books. They had books. They wrote books. <laughs> they wrote loads of books. They're also like way, way, way more relevant. Because they were actually like like extremely relevant for a very brief period of time in mm-hmm. the 60s. They were like one of the, not a driving force, but they're very, very active and quite important around the period of the uprising in France in May 68, which was a monumental event, which is kind of glossed over uh, a lot more. Um, the Paris Commune? Is that what it's called? No, well, like, yeah, that was the, par- the Paris Commune was in 1870. And then the May 68 was kind of inspired by it in certain mm-hmm. ways. But it was just, it was, it was like a revolt. It was like a mass strike. And. Oh, this is the students and all. The students, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. The students. That, the May days. All that jazz. It always happens in May for some reason. The Paris Commune was in but May. But it's as good, well. you know? 
Yeah, well, it's good. Everyone's out. Everyone's free time. Yeah. And uh, they nearly overthrew the government. The Charles de Gaulle actually fled the country for uh, about a day for for several. Shit, se- it's happening again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> for several hours, he fled the country. He was like, things are kicking off. I don't know if things are going to be, if uh, the country's still going to be there when I get back. Um, and they were an inspiration for a lot of the people that were working towards that kind of like that revolt. Uh, but at the same time, they, because of there's like limitations to their philosophy, so they're very like individualist, very kind of. Uh, this is my understanding of it anyway. They're very kind of uh, more anarchists mm-hmm. rather than socialists. So they had like different, for example, this film, Can Dialectics, Can Dialectics Break Bricks, very critical of the French Communist Party or French trade unions, stuff like that, who were also kind of the uh, the driving force behind the protests. Um, so they didn't have a lot of sway with the institutional organization of the mm-hmm. protests. And at the end of the day, you know, kind of leading into their own prophecy, the situationist prophecy, the protests were betrayed by the unions and all that stuff, and they all came to a an agreement to stop the the uprising after two weeks or something like that. Um, after which the situation just became completely irrelevant on a political level, and uh, their legacy is kind of confined to art and political theory. And um, they're not very well known mm-hmm. at all because they're also quite hard to understand. Yeah, because <laughs> it's they like have so that the, the they have this uh, concept of uh, psychogeography which the board, I believe, worked on, where there's this idea of, like, kind of uh, rebuilding your mind uh, in, like, a physical sense by walking, taking, like, just random fucking... Like, you, you come up to a corner, usually you turn right, you turn left instead. Like, mm-hmm. that's that's just how simple it is. But they'd make it sound extremely complicated, <laughs> you know? So you just, you're, just wander. You're going against... Yeah, it's, it's just wandering around, like, the, the flaneur. It's like a it's like a building upon that idea. Um. But they uh, they figured it as kind of like a rebellion against capitalism and like the the constraints of the state, it's like trying to mold you into a like a robot, and you rebel against that by just taking the different path, literally and uh, theoretically and politically and all that stuff. Um, and they call that a derive. So, um, but derive is also a theoretical concept as well. Um, they also had day tournament, which was when they would go up and kind of reclaim a capitalist work of art or capitalist whatever, uh, like an advertising sign or like a, an event, uh, a public event or whatever, and they go up and reclaim it, uh, play a prank essentially mm-hmm. uh, to peel back the layers and show people what was happening underneath. Yeah. Um, it, was, it was pranks and art, public art, and kind of guerrilla artistic warfare yeah. from a, like an extremely political perspective. Like mm-hmm. It wasn't just for fun or being like, oh, like the, you know, we live in a society. It was that, but it had like a clear goal. Yeah, like they, had, yeah. they had a goal that they wanted to get to, which they didn't get to in the end. And uh, for like a, a sect or like a, a movement that was so focused on media, they bizarrely don't really have... A lot of films. They don't have any films. Yeah. Yeah, which is really weird. Yeah. They are, they are extremely influential in art. Uh, well, I was in Paris, uh, what, two weeks ago. And there's a museum... Um, and at the, it was like I think I was talking about it last episode where it's like it starts with the kind of the Roman fort Paris in the basement it goes up medieval uh, early modern you know romantic Paris 20th century um, and the top level they had 20th century and they had they, they, they kind of they like slightly kind of skipped over World War II <laughs> maybe understandable <laughs> and there's only like a small room for that yeah yeah um, and with the documentary playing and in the documentary they have situations talking about the destruction of all paris yeah because after the war obviously everything was bombed and uh, but after they also used the opportunity to basically rebuild huge parts of the city mm-hmm. um and gentrify a lot of it and just change the city and they had this documentary playing on the wall of this guy just like railing against the new changes at the new boulevards that were being put in and uh, which are now kind of held as like you know these things that kind of uh capture the beauty or like embody our ideal of Paris is mm-hmm. like the city of love and beauty and all this stuff. Um, and they had, had loads of art on the wall from the May 68 Risings, which were very, like, extremely heavily influenced by situationist art mm-hmm. and how they kind of played a role in that era um, in terms of, like, taking material from the environment directly around them and remixing it to serve a political or a theoretical goal. Uh, so they're extremely influential in art, but they don't have any movies, which just doesn't really make sense to me. Yeah. Um, but this they, do is have, they do have one. <laughs> they do have one movie, which is why I thought it was kind of interesting just 
to have a look at it. So yeah, can, can dialectics break bricks? It's a Hong Kong martial arts film. Just the visuals. I don't know even know what the film's called. Doesn't no idea. It doesn't really matter. Uh, it's just this crazy Hong Kong martial arts film. I wouldn't even call it crazy. It's just a bog standard Hong Kong film. It's just <laughs> yeah. It's just it's just a, it's just a martial arts film, which is dubbed over by members of the Situationist International, um, and it kind of works because obviously it's all originally Chinese. Yeah. So it's a dub, and then we're reading it as a sub. It's a sub of a dub. Um, which is a reconfiguration of a film which has nothing to do with what, what's actually happening yeah. in the audio track. Like, it film. literally, at the start of the film, has, like, the director's name come up and the the commentary goes, like, and now for a person that has no idea what we have done with, with, with their film. <laughs> and we'll never know what we did with their, fi- with their film. Yeah, because no one's ever heard of this film. Yeah, it, wasn't, it wasn't really influential at all. It's just a random Hong Kong film. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they just, they took material that they found. Uh, the theoretical basis for the film is to make something... Uh, extremely political that would get across their point but which would also serve as a a spectacle in, yeah. in and of itself yeah it's kind of turning a, a day tour mom it's mentioned in the film they mentioned the idea of a day tour mom uh, right at the end um of uh kind of bending this, this spectacle back in on itself and weaponizing the the power of you know the spectacle of people fighting mm-hmm. kung fu uh, yeah. you know like all this kind of like jumping this, insanely high up into yeah this. yeah all these, these stimulating visuals to make a a very uh a very political very socialist very emancipatory point uh, which you wouldn't get in the film as it was originally made mm-hmm. you know yeah so yeah like definitely because like that's because when you're watching this film you're just like this is one of the weirdest things i've ever fucking seen mm. because it's like it's like you know it's a hong kong action film you know it's set you know, fucking 1700s, 1800s, whatever it's meant to be set. You know, there's samurai, like they're using samurai swords to fight each other. Some of the seppuku one scene. Um, all this fucking like, you know, old, you know, it's a martial arts film. But they're talking, there's like a bit where like a little kid pushes a little girl to the ground and he's like, you're an idealist who still thinks that Castro's going to win and then he legs it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and it's just like, <laughs> this movie is so fucking weird. Yeah, yeah. Like, all the dialogue, because again, it's dubbed over, is like, referencing much more modern stuff. Like, they're talking about Stalin, they're talking about Lenin, they're talking about Mao, they talk about um, the West versus the East, uh, like, in terms of, you know, about the East being, you know, Russia and also China. Um, uh, they have all these mad references to shit that, like, I didn't get, like, I would say I picked up on, like, one third of the references <laughs> in this film. Um, and just, like, which is, it's so absurd. But because of how absurd it is and how ridiculous it is, you really focus in on what they're saying. Mm. Um, I also think it has the benefit of, because they're taking, like, I was just saying, like, taking, like, a capitalist product you know, this is taking a Hong Kong film. These Hong Kong films were like mass produced. Like they were churning these things out because they were making a profit, and they became super uh, generic. They f- all follow a formula, like we were talking about Rocky. So in this film, like, there's a bit where like a guy, the main character is fighting off against the bad guy, and the commentator is just like, "Only a jack off would not know where this is going. Yeah, like, you yeah, know yeah. who's gonna win this." Yeah. yeah. Um, so like, it's like taking something so formulaic that like can very easily be like uh, melded and like pushed into you know a fucking shape that it can become something else very Mm. easily Uh, i was thinking like when i was watching this film i was like how have i not seen other films do this (laughs) yeah yeah like that it's it's such a good idea (laughs) yeah like it's not a film that you like sit down and watch again or it's not a film that's like particularly interesting in and of itself to watch but it's like re- it's very interesting artistic and like like thought experiment mm. um which Great statement yeah which struck me as like why it's never been like attempted i'm sure there's any other form yeah videos th- of that must be doing something yeah like this. yeah yeah and um, there must be like a full it's just so weird seeing a film to it like an hour and a half long film to it yeah yeah like i, I think there was one or it's like, you know, the ones where, like, they, they just dub over from a movie, but they, they like, make up funny things that the characters might say. Yeah. I can't remember, can't remember what they're called. They're popular back, like, a long time ago. Yeah, I can't remember what they're called. Um, but, yeah, like, that would be an example. Um, but now it would be way more, 
based around like fandom stuff, or, like remixing, mm-hmm. or like you know, like sad edits of fucking Blade Runner or whatever. Like it's best, bro. <laughs> it's kind of like. All right, I seen recently. There's like a, a fa- fans got together and made an entire Spider-Man film. Uh, oh, did you yeah. see that? I haven't seen it, but I heard about it. Yeah, Spider-Man Lotus, and it looks really well made. There's something else. Like, there's another one of those that came out recently as well. A fan oh. film. Yeah, another fan film was just a bunch of fans. They did it with Trek. We already talked about the Trek Untold. But they did oh, it with yeah, something. Yeah, yeah. There was another one as well recently, but I can't remember what it was. Yeah, yeah. And like, I see, uh, I watched the trailer and stuff, and it's like, it looks very well made for like an amateur production. Like, I think the budget was like $100,000 based off Kickstarter mm-hmm. or something like that. The effects look like very good. Mm-hmm. Like, they look, well, like, they look on par with Marvel effects. Um, the costume looks good. So dog shit is what you're saying. They, they're, they're not. They're not amazing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They're they're really not great, but like they're good for an amateur film. And uh, it looks like a good film, but like it's it's literally just they just adapt uh, like any other st- like it's 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 the story of Gwen Stacy dying. Mm-hmm. They just adapt that story. Like they could have done yeah. anything with that film. Yeah, could, they could yeah. have taken that and made it their own. Instead, they just re- they just remake a story that already exists. It just seemed like a bit of a shame. Like, yeah, like it's a like, massive shame. It's like you could do so much with this idea, yeah, but it's just a waste of people like, don't do effort. Yeah, but also like, fair enough. Like you don't need to, you don't need to do something fucking mental with it. You know? I don't know, but like, I feel like if you're if you're gonna go to all that effort, like, why not just put some mad twist on it, put your own stamp on it? Yeah, rather than just adapting word for word. Or basically, near enough, um, a story that's already been told like a very long time ago. Anyway, mm-hmm. in the style of, you know, a film that's already been made several times in the past few years. Yeah, um, it just seemed like a bit, bit of a waste, and it, it's. You could have done something fucking mental, and you didn't. Yeah, yeah, and it ties a little bit back into this film, where th- this film is, is something that, that takes a film that's already been made, but just like reshapes it entirely, um, to serve. Uh, an entirely new point and serve an entirely new um, purpose mm-hmm. artistically and beyond. Um, and it's a good idea just to kind of like mess with stuff like that. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. And to, to, to use... Because, uh, yeah, we're always talking about like, you know, lack of originality. So, like, sometimes um, there's like, there's a lack of... Uh, yeah, there's just a lack of originality in film. Like, m- like mainstream, big blockbusters, stuff like that. There's a limit to what you can make with a big budget, mm-hmm. obviously. Oh, yeah. There's constraints, like capital constraints. Like, you're not going to get greenlit unless you can prove that, as we were saying earlier, that you can make back the box office. Mm-hmm. Uh, but that doesn't stop the people who actually watch the films or who have all this free time, as the people who made the Spider-Man for f- fan film do, um, and a lot of us do, uh, to remake or to kind of um, repurpose the material that's already there mm-hmm. uh, toward a more interesting end well, copyright bro <laughs> copyright yeah yeah but like they got away with that because if it's if it's uh, bro, there's no fucking way anyone back in the 70s was looking for copyright in a fucking hong kong film <laughs> Ex- well, exactly but it's also it's non-profit so yeah if, they, if like the spider-man film is non-profit yeah so you just so release it you get away with it mm. um it's just a passion project yeah uh, that's great for them but it's also like you know if you had any other passions because you're not kind of like you know Push them in there. Yeah, get them in. Yeah, get them in there. Like, yeah, you say something. Make make it a personal statement rather than just a reproduction of something that already exists. Yeah, like a mass production. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it's just like it's such a such a simple idea of doing something like this. And I don't know if it necessarily works a hundred percent. Like, it does work in this film for what it is, but like after a while, the kind of the gimmick essentially does kind of wear off. Oh yeah, it does get like. It does get boring, but there is... It also doesn't help that the... There's a language barrier. The language barrier, but also doesn't help that the the film that they took and dubbed over doesn't look very good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Like, yeah. it doesn't look like a very amazing film, which I guess is kind of the point because you just wanted the generic film that it's easy to follow. Like, you know that thing you're talking about, like, you can remove the sound from the film? Mm. Like, you could remove the sound from this film, and I know what's going on. Just the captions. Like, I don't need anything. This film, like, just like... the actual visuals. Like, no, take out... No, take out the audio from this film. Yeah. And, like, you know what's going on. Yeah, Like, the plot is so simple and so obvious as to what is happening. Who the bad guys are and who the good guys are. And, like... Like, everything like that. It's just... It's a Hong Kong, you know, martial arts film. But, like... 
it's not a very good Hong Kong martial arts film. The fights in this film, we were talking about how bad the fights look like <laughs> in Rocky. Jesus, the fights in this look awful. Ah, yeah, it's, like, a, it's an old ass film. Like. And there's like, whoosh, 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 for every time a blade goes. Yeah, um, yeah. There is also that they had to like reconstruct the film a little bit. Like they had to, there's certain clips that like play a couple times because... Mm. The footage doesn't exist, so they just redid it. Like, there's mm. a bit of a guy who commits seppuku, and then it's like he's dead, and then it cuts to him again. He's he's there squirming on the ground like he was alive. Like it's the same shot of him being alive again, squirming on the ground, yeah, holding yeah. his balls that are no longer there, um, and like stuff like that. It's just like, like I understand, like again, that's that's part of the style in this film where like, it is just like taking the piss and being like, this isn't, mm. this is not a serious movie. But the political message is very serious. <laughs> it is, yeah, yeah. But they're, that's the thing; they're very, very playful with that, and they uh, they wanted to make it stimulating or whatever. Mm. But it is; it's kind of it's quite long as well. I think I feel like you could make the same points in like an hour, less yeah. than an hour, forty five minutes, um, and it'd still be just as interesting, just as stimulating. You could even mess around with it a bit more, have continuity errors, whatever. It draws attention more to the. The fact that to, it, this, to is a, this is a constructed reality, yeah, one in yeah. which you, the listener, live in in the real world. Yeah, exactly. I think that would have been cool as well. Uh, it is funny though, but there it is. It actually is a funny film. I laughed numerous times. It's it's yeah, it's very funny towards the end. He's like he's talking about uh, because they they I think everyone's dead or whatever. <laughs> And he's like, they're just pretending to be dead because they're sick of voicing this this movie or something. Yeah, like yeah, that. They're, they're sick of dubbing over this movie. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Everyone's Does he even just pay pretending. The rent? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're not dead. Yeah, I thought that was pretty pretty funny. There's yeah little bits dot, dotted around, but yeah, it's very heavy on like like very like obscure political references and stuff like that, um, and the whole idea of like like the premise of like you know this organic kind of uprising against the bureaucrats and all like whatever the state. It's just kind of it's cut far away. It's very far removed mm-hmm. from like even back then. I'd say it's not really like like I don't know. Um, relevant yeah or it's not it's kind of hard to relate to i'd say yeah Um, especially when it's taking the piss so much yeah it's very hard to relate it's an interesting thought experiment though that's just uh, i feel it was was worth the watch right this is one like i know i rated this film three stars in letterbox this is one that's top i would put this high in the in like in terms of recommending a film for this podcast yeah this is high this is way up there it's it's a decent uh, i I feel like i've I've slightly recovered from my my string of thoughts my string (laughs) of thoughts Uh, this is at least an interesting you know how movie as well before this also very interesting movie yeah 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 you know you've you've been you've really fucking smashed me up bro i've been been trying i've been putting an effort you've been putting the you've been putting that graft in fair fucks to mark (laughs) it's working out for you (laughs) keep it up (laughs) thank you thank you guys um yeah like it's just like yeah, it is like a film that has like a, like a very unusual gimmick mm. and one that does work on me for the most part. But in terms of a film film, yeah, don't really know about that, but it's mm. still decent. Like it's still like a it's like I like I'd recommend this film to very particular people. <laughs> exactly, yeah. Very yeah. and like that was You wouldn't bring this home to the gaff. Be like, no. here lads, sit down, we have to watch this. This film changed my life. No. <laughs> um I it is a film that at the end of the film, I was like, I'm not entirely sure who this film is for. <laughs> uh, other than yeah. other than the 15 other, you know, situationists that didn't make this film. <laughs> I feel like in a parallel universe, it is extremely influential, though. Mm. In some kind of parallel reality. Yeah. You know? Yeah, where the situationists, you know, won. <laughs> or, yeah, yeah, or something <laughs> happened, you know? And they became more, uh, more influential. You know, watching this film is like, you can kind of see why they didn't succeed. <laughs> yeah, it's hard to kind of get... Uh, but no, no, I, I, worth I, it. Well worth it. It was a good watch. A very interesting, very interesting watch. It's also on YouTube, like yeah, easy and fucking D, easy man, handy. But yeah, we we leave it there. We'll leave it there. What's your recommended film for episode one two one? My recommended film will be Greener Grass, two thousand and nineteen, directed by. Jocelyn Debar, Don, fucking Lube. <laughs> <laughs> How do you pronounce that name? <laughs> Lube. Lube. It's a French name again. <laughs> it's all Lube. It's all Lube. <laughs> uh, this thing's on a bunch of different uh, sites. I think it's on. It's on Amazon Prime. Is so, it? Yeah. Oh, 
Oh, bitch. So, it's this one we recommend film. Don't know really anything about this film other than it's meant to be good, <laughs> apparently. Let's do um, it. Yeah, let's do it. Greener grass. Let's go back to American suburban critiques. Yay! Yes. <laughs> Love it. All right. Good night. God bless. Bye.